Good afternoon and welcome to the Subcommittee on Planning Dispositions and Concessions. I'm Council Member Ben Kalos, Chair of this Subcommittee. You can tweet me at Ben Kalos. We are joined today by uh, Council Member Ruben Diaz Sr., who is always here early and on time. We are also joined by uh, our Land Use Chair, Rafael Salamanca, and our uh, my colleague to the west and the south, uh, Keith Powers. Uh, we also have a large number of folks in the audience. Uh, thank you. I think this is our, our highest attendance for this committee ever of all time. Uh, today we'll be holding hearings on three projects with several applications, land use items 310 and 311, Waterside Plaza, land use items 313, 469, Seven Third Avenue, and land use items 314 and 315, and 316 Belmont Cove rezoning. If you are here to testify, please fill out a white slip of paper with the sergeant at arms over there in the uh, corner and make sure to hand it to the sergeant at arms. They will bring it to us. Uh, and so the first item that we will hear today is uh, Belmont Cove. Belmont Cove are land use items 314, 315, 316 to facilitate the development of a new 11-story building that will provide 157 affordable housing units, 19 enclosed accessory parking spaces, and other amenities at Block 2,945, Lots 34, 65, and 66 in the East Tremont neighborhood of the Bronx in Land Use Chair Salmanca's district. This project will be developed under HPD's ELLA program. 15% of the units will be reserved for formerly homeless households. I'd like to congratulate the chair on having his legislation for this set aside heard this morning in the Housing and Buildings Committee. And I'm sorry I wasn't able to join the press conference this morning, but I am, I am there with you uh, as a co-sponsor and in spirit. HPD is seeking approval for disposition of city-owned property block 2954, lot 65 and 66, a zoning map amendment from MM from M1-4, which is manufacturing, to R7X, which is a contextual residential district, and a zoning text amendment to designate the project area as mandatory inclusionary housing area utilization, MIH option one. Lot 34 is privately owned, is currently used for public parking. Lot 65 and 66 are city owned and currently used as accessory parking for the NYC Department of Mental of health and mental hygiene. Uh, I would now like to ask the uh, Land Use Chair if he has an opening statement. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Kalos, and uh, good afternoon uh, to HPD and to uh, Mastermind, that I may. Um, I just want to come out and just say how excited I am about this project. Um, I've worked with the uh, developer for over eight months now, close to a year, on this project. He came. His team came to my office, um, we sat down, and you know, this project really symbolizes what my, the, the composition of my community, which is a very low income community, but I also have working class families in my district. Um, and uh, he was able to, uh, to make the financing work where there's a 15% homeless set aside. Uh, the concern that I have with this project is the only concern I have with this project is that they were able to get a, a, a publicly owned lot that, that DOH had oversight on and they were using as a parking. And in order to negotiate with the city and DOH, the agreement was that they were going to set aside 19 parking spaces, 18 of, of which were going to be for Department of Health and Mental Hygiene employees. Um, if you know that area on Arthur Avenue is a very congested area, you have uh, multiple municipal buildings, parking is difficult for my constituents there, and um, I, I, I feel that if we are going to add parking to this building, these parking slots should be for the residents of the building, not for DOH employees. Uh, I've proposed an alternative where in front of the DOH building, there is um, parallel parking and uh, they can change they can they can change the parking regulations or they can change the composition of that parking there from parallel parking to 90 degree angle parking, which will go along with that entire strip because that entire strip on Arthur Avenue in that specific area, there is 90 degree parking, which would 
give you more parking slots, and I feel that DOH employees can park in the street. Um, and so those are my concerns, and I look forward to hearing from the administration as to uh, how we can uh, work around this. Thank you, Chair. It, it is rare, but uh, another member would like to make an opening statement on this item. I'd like to recognize uh, Ruben Diaz, Sr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I'm just want to say that there was a time when the Bronx was the laughing stock of the whole nation, and people left the Bronx, people abandoned the Bronx, people, even banks, red line in the Bronx, and, and businesses, and few people stood in the Bronx. And there were so few, few organizations that uh, stood there, a building, and giving the Bronx a new face, a new look. And I'm proud to say that one of those organizations, Mastermind, Mastermind have been working in the Bronx and creating not only housing, but jobs, opportunity for our community. And so far, there's, there's, there has not been an, an, an occasion or an instance when anybody had complained or had given us any uh, bad news about Mastermind. So... I'm proud uh, that I'm here today, and I would like to say that I uh, congratulate Mastermind and their, all, their, all what they have done for the Bronx and making the Bronx proud. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll now ask committee, I will now ask those who plan to testify, including Mastermind, to please state their names for the record, and I'll ask the uh, committee council to uh, swear in the panel. Ted Weinstein, HPD, Director of Bronx Planning. Uh, Genevieve Michael, uh, Executive Director of Government Affairs at HPD. Radame Perez, Chief Operating Officer at Mastermind Development. Um, so, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, Nellie Evans, Best Development Group, um, uh, Consultant to Mastermind. Nora Martins, Ackerman LLP, Land Use Council. Thank you. So now I'll need each of you to say yes to the following question. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. You may begin. Uh, land use number 314 to 316 are related to ULERP actions seeking project and disposition approval for two city-owned lots located at 1836 and 1840 Belmont Avenue uh, in the Tremont Ble Belmont section of the Bronx Council District 17 and is known as Belmont Cove. The project site will also include the adjoining privately owned lot 34. The city-owned parcels are currently used as parking for city vehicles by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. The sponsor for the project, Mastermind Development LLC, proposes to develop Belmont Cove under HPD's Extremely Low and Low Income Affordability ELLA program. Under the ELLA program, sponsors develop multifamily buildings in order to create low-income rental housing for families with a range of incomes from 30% to 60% of the area median income, and projects may include a tier of units with rents targeted to households earning up to 100% of AMI. Subject to project underwriting, up to 30% of the units may be rented to formerly homeless households referred by the Department of Homeless Housing or other public agencies. Uh, land use number 314 is related to an amendment of the zoning map. In the early 1980s, the city-owned sites had been designated as an M14 in order to construct a sanitation garage. However, the garage was never built, and the current zoning does not present residential buildings. Therefore, HPD is seeking to change the rezoned area from an N14 district to an R7X district property in order to facilitate the development of a residential building. Land use number 315 seeks approval for an amendment of the zoning resolution in order to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area mapping option one. All three lots would be rezoned and designated as an MIH and the proposed building would include 40 permanently affordable units. 
Land use number 316 will facilitate the construction of an 11-story mixed-use building containing 157 rental units plus one superintendent's unit and 19 parking spaces, of which 18 will be reserved for by DOHMH, which operates a health center across from the project site. The building comprises a mixture of unit types, including 18 studios, 71 one-bedrooms, 51 two-bedrooms, and 17 three-bedrooms at varying income tiers distributed throughout the building. Formerly homeless tenants referred by DHS will pay up to 30% of their income as rent. For other tenants, rents will be established with tiers affordable to families earning up to 30 to 80% of AMI, with up to 20% of the units paying up to 100% of AMI. It's anticipated that the rents will range from approximately $215 at the lowest tier for a studio to 2014 at the highest income tier for a three-bedroom apartment. Amenities for this project include a laundry room on every floor, two recreation rooms, and outdoor recreation space. As of uh, January 8th, 2019, the estimated total development cost of the project is approximately $65 million, which is subject to change. Additionally, as of January of this year, city subsidy is approximately 45% of the total development cost from HDC, HPD, and $650,000 in Rezo A fundings from Councilmember Salamanca. As an ELA, this project will receive an as-of-right tax exemption under 420C, and the regulatory agreement will have a term of 60 years. In order to facilitate construction of the Delmont Belmont Cove project, HPD is before the planning subcommittee requesting approval of LU numbers 314, 315, and 316. Um, and just to the remarks from Councilmember Salamanca, I certainly, you know, understand that we have some outstanding parking items that, you know, we're trying to work through with our sister agencies, but we've been, you know, very thankful for Councilmember's support and particularly the Rezo A funding um, and partnership on this project. In the chair's opening remarks in your, uh, sorry, there's more testimony, is there not? Yes, thank you. Um, so, firstly, thank you to the subcommittee and its chair and uh, some of the kind words that were said by its members, including Council Member uh, Diaz. Um, to, to introduce myself to the entire subcommittee, I am Radami Perez, the developer uh, at Mastermind. We are a minority-owned Bronx-based business. I'm third generation in this family business. And uh, we have been developing affordable housing now for more than 10 years. Um, uh, most recently, we completed a 255-unit development at Tremont Renaissance, uh, is what we call it. It's two, uh, about three blocks from this site, um, and um, it, it, it's near completion, and it's going to be a great project that really has uh, different incomes than what we're proposing here, but we have low income, moderate income, and 90% AMIs. Um, I want to note that the Belmont Cove project will have, as, as I think mentioned before, an 11, star, 11 stories. Quick, quick item. I'm just going to note that we probably have at least 50 folks in the room waiting on the next item, and this is a quick presentation, so the quicker you can get through it, the better. Uh, if you can read at the same speed as the, uh, as the <laughs> HPD representative did. I wasn't necessarily reading, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and nip it in the bud. Um, th this is the, we propose to finance this under the other program where the ranges, the rents will range from 30% to 80% of AMI. Um, no, I wanted to allow Nora to go into the details and the rationale for the proposed rezoning, if, if that's appropriate now, Count, uh, Very Chairman. Brief. Yep, let's just move quickly and get through the presentation. There are a number of slides. Good morning, Nora Martins. Thank you for having us today. Um, there are a number of slides. You have them before you. We're not going to go through all of them. It's for information. Just a quick overview of the proposed rezoning. Uh, there's a rendering here, which you have in your package, showing the proposed 11-story building in context uh, with the Cross Bronx to the south um, and a 20-story NYCHA towers um, also to the south of the Bro South Bronx Expressway, Cross Bronx Expressway, sorry. Skip through. You can see where the project area is. It's currently zoned M14. It was zoned um, for, in 1982 for purposes of a sanitation garage, which was never built. Um, so the proposed rezoning, which is uh, to an R7X, would restore the historic residential zoning designation to the site, which is consistent with the surrounding residential neighborhood. Proposed uh, zoning uh, actions, Genevieve went through them all, so rezoning from the M14 to the R7X, the MIH designation, which here is proposed to be option one, 25% at 60% AMI, and then um, 
disposition of city-owned property for two of the parcels of the development site. You have some photos in your package. You can take a look at those showing the existing use of the site for parking and some neighborhood context. And then uh, we have some plans also, but I think we're opening up to uh, questions at this point. Uh, if you have any questions about the design of the building, we have the project architect here to answer any questions. Questions are to HPD. In second paragraph of your testimony, you indicated the project would be uh, include tier units with rents targeted to households earning 100% of AMI, both the chair's remarks and uh, the testimony we just received from the developer indicate uh, a range between uh, 30 and 80 percent of AMI. What is the correct answer? Uh, so what the developer has in their presentation is certainly reflective of the project and what we are pursuing under the 420C. Uh, the language I have in my testimony describes the uh, what an ELLA generally does uh, because, you know, the we finance ELLAs under 420C tax exemption, which is an as of right tax exemption. Um, so again, defer to development team on the specifics. That is what they have worked out with our team. But broadly, this is how we describe the ELLA. Okay, so the regulatory agreement for this project is capped at 80%. Uh, the, I mean, that is what will be reflected in the 420C tax exemption that they are going through. Additionally, uh, the chair is passionate about 15% uh, homeless set aside. It's something I agree with him on. In your testimony, you indicate a 30% set aside, which is very generous. We would love to see 30% set aside for homeless. Which number is it? So generally speaking, under uh, current ELLA term sheets, we either do 10 or we do 30. In this case, we are able to work out with the development team uh, what they showed. Uh, on, slide, yeah. on slide number two, I see vacant lots. I see a vacant lot across the street. I see two vacant lots across the street. Who owns those vacant lots? Is there an ability to throw those into the mix in order to uh, have the efficiency of having multiple, have, have one construction company build all three sites? Uh, my understanding is that they are privately owned. Um, and I think that you know we wanted to move forward with this project uh, as conceived. My burning question since I saw this project is why the name Mastermind? <laughs> I'd like to recognize we've been joined by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. Hello. Um, Does it have anything to do with the Milton Bradley game? Well, that's very funny. It, uh, no, it doesn't have anything to do with the Milton Bradley game. So um, it's probably too long of a story to get into today. But uh, my 30-second version. My, the 30-second version is my grandfather, Santiago Perez, had a consultant before he decided to go from bodegas to supermarkets and then to buying parts of the borough that he saw burning right behind his bodega. And uh, the consultant said to him that um, there was a number of pastors um, that at that time, uh, evangelical and Protestant pastors, and one of them had come up with the mastermind principle uh, you can look up the mastermind principle. Uh, you see some people nodding their heads here. Um, and the idea was basically that to go from that kind of vision from a bodega to being able to purchase various lots throughout the borough that he had been passionately, uh, came come from Puerto Rico and passionately called his new home, took a mastermind to be able to achieve such a vision. And uh, Okay, that is apparently something from uh, Napoleon Hill, 17 Principles of personal achievement and there are t-shirts available online. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, I'm gonna just jump through a lot of questions. The quicker we get through them, the quicker it goes. I wanna thank the city, the HPD for being more transparent on this project and just sharing that the total subsidies are approximately 45% uh, of the total development costs. So uh, Mastermind is the developer, who is the contractor? Joy Construction. Joy Construction, uh, and when is uh, the project projected to start? Well, it is the hope that we would close in June, and then we'd start right away. And that's what we have planned. Is there any existing debt on the project? No. 
What are the hard costs out of your $65 million project? Hard costs would be about uh, 43000 of that. 43000 a unit? Uh, well, no, 43, sorry, 43 million for the whole building. That was the right number. Yes. Uh, and soft costs, I, I imagine it is $22 million. Um, About, yes, a little bit less than that. What is the correct number? Uh, soft cost would be uh, 10, 10 million dollars, and then there's a developer fee of eight. So the developer fee is 22 million. The developer fee is eight million dollars. Sorry, eight million. Yes. I'm still missing four million dollars. Well, there is acquisition cost of uh, $2.7 million. Now I'm left with $1 million we need to track okay. down. And I think that that has to do with just rounding. So the, um, the construction cost would be $43 million, $265,752. And then soft cost is $10,808,104. Okay, I'll, I will trust you. Thank you for the transparency. What is the acquisition cost? I thought this was city land that you're getting for free. The acquisition cost, I don't know. Uh, I think we actually, I think we just got an appraisal value. I don't have it in front of me, but I will get it to you. Is the developer paying for the property or is it being given for a dollar? It's a dollar. Dollar tax lot. So did I just knock $2.7 million off the cost no. of this project or? No, what, what that's. About our property? The 2.7 would be for the private land. Right. There's two, two publicly owned properties. I need folks on. I need folks on the uh, mics, please. Oh, okay. So the 2.7 is for the private land. So you don't already own it, or the entity you're creating is purchasing it from my mastermind. That's correct. Okay. Um, fair. All right. We can. How long was the lot vacant before it was uh, moved over? How long has this uh, sanitation garage been in development? The, the sanitation garage just never materialized. Um, I think the question is how long has, has um, DOA may HMH been using it? Um, As is a frequent question, we have a lot of property throughout the city that isn't being used, and the question is just how long did the city sit with an empty lot that was supposed to become a sanitation garage before we finally came around and said, you know what, we should build something here, build affordable housing. So when did the, when was it cited to be a sanitation garage? 1982. 1982. That's when the ULERP application to rezone the property was approved. Okay. So it has been sitting there for 27 years. Used by DOHMH as a parking lot. Okay, uh, as we move along, this will there will be accessory. To any commercial space? No commercial space. What is the current AMI of the current neighborhood? How what what? How much do people make in this neighborhood? The median income of Community Board Six is twenty-two thousand six hundred. And the mean household income, the median, is not available for the census tract, but the census tract 369.01 is 27,342. That's about, depending on household size, that's uh, in the 30% AMI range. Okay. And you'll be, how much of the project is going to be at 30% of AMI? Um, it'll be about 25%. Okay. Uh, most often, anyone who watches these regularly will, will note that I usually will admonish a developer, but this, the fact that the range is from 27% uh, up to 57% and has a substantial homeless set aside indicates that this is not having the same gentrifying effect as if it was going to have a 100% AMI or higher. Believe you me, I would have given you a lot of trouble over that. Uh, just moving through. Uh, what is the value of the city's disposition of land? I think th that's the appraisal we've mm -hmm. been waiting on that I, I, I think that I do now have, but I don't have it on my fingertips, but we'll get it to the committee. Uh, 
Okay. I'm instructing the committee to please make sure that we receive the appraisal value before we allow this to be scheduled for a vote. Uh, this is there is a 420C tax abatement on this project, which is as of right. Uh, when we do Article 11s, we would like to. We often want to know what the uh, tax implications are, what it's going to cost the city. And your testimony transparently said it's going to be 45% of the project is subsidized. Does that include the 420C? Um, I don't have the information on the 420C in front of me because it's not what's before the council today. We, we would like to know the, the overall cost for this action uh, it, in the future. And then you disclosed the HPD subsidies, which are up to $145,000 per dwelling unit under the LO term sheet. Yep. Is, are you going under the limit or will you be going over the limit as I have learned in other <laughs> hearings? Uh, again, I uh, don't have the information in front of me on the ELA tax exemption because that's not what's before the council. In terms of the contractor joy con uh, construction, are they an MWBE? Are you using MWBEs as mastermind in MWBE? Or if you are not qualified for an MWBE status, uh, do you have minority and women leadership of your organizations? Yes. Um, mastermind Development is a minority-owned company. Uh, the Noir Architects, our architectural firm, uh, that we've used on this, that we're using on this project, and, and many others before that, is a certified New York State minority-owned uh, business, and we anticipate exceeding, as we normally do, the 25% threshold um, that uh, of using uh, qualified MWBEs and in, in a variety of trades. You mentioned doing the work of the trades. I am over. I am concerned that when, if somebody is getting paid the minimum wage, which was recently increased to fifteen dollars an hour, that those people will end up making twenty-seven thousand three hundred dollars a year. That is, if they work full time every day without a day off. And I'm concerned that that's roughly around the thirty percent AMI threshold, even with the serious amount of thirty percent AMI housing that you're making. Uh, my question is, will you be paying people the minimum wage such that they will actually need the affordable housing that they are building, which I believe may exacerbate the crisis, or will you be paying them more so that they won't need the affordable housing? So uh, the laborers that the, the general contractor employs and those that the, their subcontractors employ generally make more than minimum wage. Do you know if they make the same wage as other people in the neighborhood for similar work? I, I, they, they make the market wage for the job that they do, which is above minimum wage. And do they get health insurance so that they get hurt on the job or disability insurance so that they just, they don't have to wait on a workers' comp claim, but they can get preventative care and still retire if something goes wrong on the job site, the construction is actually very dangerous. No, of course. And our our general contractor, Joy Construction, has a history of, of, of doing the right thing. But above and beyond that, uh, they, do, um, they, they do maintain workers' comp uh, for all of their employees and, and, and they require health, it. What about health and disability? Uh, similarly. So everyone working on this site will have health insurance and disability insurance? They, they require, again, the, the general contractor, who I'm speaking for now, uh, will provide, uh, will require that everyone has workers' comp insurance. Workers' comp and health insurance are not the same. The, oh, no, I'm not speaking about the health right now. So with the health benefits, they, all of their employees receive he uh, health benefits. Um, so as it relates to joy construction and the general contractor, yes, all their employees. So all their care. construction workers will have that yeah. and they'll have disability. Will they be able to retire one day? Will they have a, a retirement vehicle? Um, I uh, yeah, I can't speak to that. Uh, similarly, when the people operate the building, will they need affordable housing? Will they be making the minimum wage? Will they be making more than that? Will they have 
access to health insurance? Will they have access? Will they have health insurance? Will they have disability insurance? Will they have a retirement? Again, I, I, I can't speak with that much familiarity with that. You're going to operate the building after you build it? Yes. Are you going to pay, do you pay your people who operate your buildings more than a minimum wage? Oh, yes, yes. So you'll pay the folks on this site more than a minimum wage? The, uh, the, in the maintenance and operation of yes. the building, yes. And they'll have health insurance and disability insurance? Uh, yes. And a, and a retirement account? I, I don't know that right now. Do you? Do you does it, it, management it, it, of Mastermind have access to right, 401k? So, or right, right. If you're saying 401k, yes. 401k or pension or defined benefit. They will have a 401k. Okay, I, I'm part. I, I, I'm a city employee, so I have a defined benefit program. I think that's better than right. It is a 401k. Uh, I, I think those are very important values. I know there's folks asking why. Part of the reason is because we want to make sure that when we're taking your city tax dollars. And you just heard that this is a $65 million project. 45% is coming from your pockets. We want to make sure that it isn't making the affordable housing crisis worse. We want to make sure that when people do the work, that they actually are safe. So it's, a, it's an important value. So I, I know folks are waiting patiently, but it's just important. And then uh, I think my favorite question I get to ask at this is, uh, do you have a local hire requirement? We, we do like, uh, hire locally, yes. If somebody is watching right now at home and they live in the neighborhood and they would like a job to help build this construction site or help maintain the building once constructed, what number can they call for a job? They should Making more than the minimum wage. <laughs> <laughs> they should call me at 718-933-1353. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge you've been joined by Councilmember Chaim Deutsch. Does I'd like to uh, recognize Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. Thank you, Chair Kalos, and good afternoon. It's um, a pleasure to be here, and as a member of the committee, I thank you for uh, your testimony and certainly looking at the schematics. I know Belmont Cove will be a welcomed addition to the Bronx. Um, I know our Chair of Land Use, uh, Chair Salamanca, was here earlier today, and I just wanted to make sure I go on record in really recognizing that 157 units and most of the units being at 30, 40, 50, and 60 percent of the the area median income is really uh, a welcome addition to the Bronx and looking at income diversity. And the chair just mentioned a topic that is very, very familiar and something I'm very passionate about, and that's local hiring and making sure we have responsible contracting and that developers are doing right by our people in the Bronx. Um, and I have a relationship, and I know Mastermind, I know the work you've done through the years of being in the Bronx in both my district and others. And so I want to make sure that as this conversation continues, a local hiring plan and MWBE provisions um, must be a part of this final agreement. Um, it's not something that we should be suggesting. It's something that really should be offered from the developers. We shouldn't have to continuously, every time there's a project before us, ask about these things because they should already be a part of the original plan. And I want to make sure that the Joy Construction and everyone else that continues to look at the Bronx in a way where we're looking at a lot of opportunity in our borough, I want to make sure that as great projects come to our borough, we need to make sure that even greater jobs come to our borough. It's insulting that Bronx residents don't see these opportunities as a chance to not only build the housing, but live in it as well. And so we can have this conversation. It's not mutually exclusive. And, you know, Councilmember Salamanca has been a champion of set-asides, and I'm grateful that this project has 15% of formerly homeless families because we want to make sure that our borough is a part of this citywide problem. Um, so I applaud the project that's coming to us and I want to make sure, um, Rada May and your team, um, please make sure that MWBE provisions and local hiring and responsible contracting is a part of the conversations moving forward. Um, so I appreciate it. Don't really have a question, um, but more so a comment and wanted to make sure that I go on record as a neighbor of District 17. District 16 wants to follow in a lot of the great work that's happening in Belmont and in Tremont. So I thank you for coming today and we look forward to working with you. Thank you, Chair.
Uh, I just want to, as just a closing remark, as part of MIHCQA, we reduced parking requirements as part of the affordable housing in order to have a city that is less reliant on uh, vehicles. And so one of the items that we had mentioned and we had asked that DOHMH come to this hearing, I see that they are not here. But I just want to echo the land use chair's desire to make sure that we move the vehicles off this lot and make sure that we set aside parking for the city vehicles and that that is an important consideration for this committee's support. Uh, are, are we on the same page? I think we are certainly looking at possible solutions there. Thank you. Uh, seeing, are, are there any people here to testify on this item? Ah, we have uh, Zamir Khan from 32BJ uh, here to testify in opposition to uh, this land use item. Uh, the current panel is excused. Mr. Khan, you may begin, and thank you for being here. Thank you for being in the audience. I, I will just make a note on the record that uh, Mr. Khan was uh, nodding enthusiastically <laughs> as I was talking to folks about how important it is to support our workers in our city. Uh, thank you for having us, uh, Chair Kalos and members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Zamir Khan. I'm a doorman from the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I've been a member of 32BJ for Which the building? Past, uh, 165 72nd Street. Are Thank you, you for there? all that you do in our neighborhood, and I can speak on behalf of my constituency. Uh, if you work in our neighborhood, you're probably like one of the family, so thank you. Thank you for having us, and it's uh, great to be part of a union who can serve you guys in that way. Uh, my union represents over 80,000 building service workers across New York City. Uh, including through 3,000 workers who work in affordable housing. I'm here today on behalf of my union to speak to how Mastermind LTD's proposed development at Belmont Cove could impact the workers. Uh, as you know, 32BJ believes that developers should commit to providing good building service jobs in order to build a more equitable economy here in New York City. Uh, we know that projects like this, which are 100% affordable, are vital for working families, but we also believe they fall short of their mission if they don't provide good jobs. Uh, we are in conversation with Mastermind LTD about this issue and hope to continue the discussion. However, as of now, there is no commitment to provide building service jobs that pay area standards at this project. We see this as a cause for concern. Projects receiving public resources should not undercut the standards that building service workers have fought for. We are calling on the city and the developer to guarantee that workers at Belmont Cove are paid family sustaining wages and benefits. Taxpayer dollars and public land should, should be used to create the good jobs that working families and the broader Bronx community deserve. We respectfully urge you to ensure that there is a commitment to providing good building service jobs at Belmont Cove before approving the project. Thank you for having us and have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, you. We'll excuse this uh, item, this panel. Thank you. Are there any additional members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, I now close the public hearing on land use items 314, 315, and 316. Uh, having rejiggered the agenda for those of you in the audience uh, and making sure we didn't put an another item ahead of you, uh, I want to make sure that folks who haven't already have signed up. It's these sheets of paper. Uh, we have quite a stack. It's going to be a long day. Uh, but I want to thank all of you for being here. This is what democracy looks like, so I appreciate it. Uh, so we will be holding a hearing on land use items 310 and 311 
Waterside Plaza. This is an application to facilitate the preservation of 325 affordable housing units, which are 28% of the total 1,470 units at 10, 20, 25, 30, and 40 Waterside Plaza in Kipps Bay in Manhattan Council Member Keith Powers District. HPD is requesting a disposition of city-owned property and an amendment to the Waterside Urban Renewal Plan for a new 99-year term extending to 2,116. Most of us in this room will not be here then, by then. Uh, Trying. Trying. Yeah. <laughs> it's not worth being the head in the jar if you watch Futurama, <laughs> it's just not worth it. Uh, before opening this public hearing, I'd like to invite Council Member Powers to provide some remarks. Thank you, and good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Actually, just a, just a show of hands if you're here for Waterside. You guys travel very well. Um, uh, well, thank you, and thank you to everybody who's here uh, today from Waterside Plaza uh, to hear. I'm Council Member Keith Powers. I represent Waterside, proudly represent Waterside, which is the community where uh, I've spent a lot of time as a, as a child playing in their wonderful playgrounds and also growing up right across the street from there. Uh, I want to thank Chairman Kalos and the subcommittee for their consideration of this affordable housing deal between Waterside Plaza and the Department of Housing Preservation Development, uh, which I believe provides substantial benefits to tenants on a generational scale. Uh, I want to thank the, uh, all the tenants who are here, notably the head of the Tenants Association, Janet Handel, who, uh, for the tenants who are here, know this already, but has been working very diligently and hard to make sure this deal is as inclusive as possible for everybody who lives there. I want to thank the owners of Waterside Plaza, um, uh, Richard Dick Ravitch, who is represented as well uh, here through his, uh, his representative, Peter Davis and Peter, and the Waterside Plaza management, and of course, a team at HPD for their ongoing efforts to help make this deal a reality. Um, I will try to keep these short and go quicker. But uh, as folks know, this was a former Mitchell Lama program that was originally given a 99-year lease in 1974. Today, we're here discussing an amendment to that lease to extend the lease uh, back to 99 years. Um, it's also an opportunity to renew Waterside Plaza's legacy as an affordable community for the middle class. That is essentially the conversation we've been having for the, I think, since I came into office, which was how to preserve this as a middle class community that it was built to be and that we still aspire for it to be. Um, this will allow hundreds of tenants who live there today to continue to live there and be able to afford the rent. It also will provide an opportunity for folks who look at Waterside as a future home to be affordable for the generations to come. Um, today we're talking really about 325 units to cover all the settling tenants that remained at Waterside since the exit of the program from Mitchell um, which I should also note many of us believed, or I wasn't there, but many believed that they would be in rent stabilization after leaving Mitchell Lama and found out because of a quirk in the law that they were not able to be eligible for rent stabilization. The deal that we are talking about today provides substantial relief for rent burden tenants through a one-time reduction in rent, permanently freezes the rent for any household earning below HPD's definition of middle income, and limits increases for middle, clan re middle income residents. After a settling tenant or a spouse has ended their tenancy, the unit will be made available through the lottery system to those qualified based on income with a mix of about 120% uh, for 75 years. I will say we see few deals that I think are as good as this, but I know many of us are going to be here today advocating for uh, even more and making it sure that it is as inclusive as possible. Um, I think this is still unprecedented, but with the room for improvement, many tenants have expressed concern about their affordability to afford their apartments once they retire in, uh, in the coming years. Um, several of those tenants have noted that if they were unable to afford their rent upon retirement and had to move, their option would be an HPD Housing Connect lottery apartment, meaning that the home in which they have lived for decades would then be placed in that same lottery system and they would have to actually relocate. And I think that is sort of the summary of why so many of us, myself included, have been advocating for a further imp uh, increase to the, pro to the, to the deal which, was, uh, which would allow folks who are facing retirement to still look at this as a place and not to be unaffordable. Um, given the state of affordable housing in New York, I think we can all sympathize with that apprehension about it. Um, with all that being said, I 
was supportive at the beginning of a deal that preserves the future of, of, of middle income tenants here in New York City, in my district, in a wonderful neighborhood. And I'm grateful that we are where we are today. And again, I again want to thank all who have sat around that table for hours trying to get us there. Um, I think it is critical that we continue to work towards an agreement that will protect those vulnerable tenants that we think will still be vulnerable after uh, and as they are on the verge of retirement. Um, I continue to be engaged with all the parties here to seek to finalize a deal that will provide the greatest benefits to the most number of people. And I've heard from all of you, I think, along the way about your stress on how important the deal is, but how important it is to get that deal right as we face, um, as it comes to the City Council. So I know we'll continue to negotiate, and I urge my colleagues on Land Use Committee and the rest of the City Council to, to support the deal, but understanding that we really want to fight to make it as affordable for everybody. Um, I think this provides ample benefit to the tenants who help make Waterside the incredible community is today and will continue to make it a, a wonderful community in the decades to come. And for that reason, I am uh, su I'm supportive of it, but I certainly think we can do more. And I want to thank all those who will be here today to also add their voices to that mix. Thank you. The panel can please identify themselves, and then we will ask committee council to swear you in. Jeremy Hoffman, Assistant Commissioner for New Construction Finance at HPD. Uh, Genevieve Michael, Executive Director of Government Affairs at HPD. Peter Davis, Managing Director of Waterside Plaza. Uh, Ken Laurie, Counsel to Waterside Plaza, Catton Mutual Rosamond Law Firm. You may begin. Oh, please swear them in. Um, will you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Please make sure your mic is on. Yes. 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 You may now begin. Okay. The last one was a fake. <laughs> uh, land use numbers 310 and 311 are related to ULERP actions seeking the urban renewal disposition of city-owned property located at Block 991, Lot 60 and 61 within the Waterside Plaza Urban Renewal Area and an amendment to the Waterside Plaza Urban Renewal Plan in the Kipps Bay neighborhood in the Borough of Manhattan, Council District 4, which will bring long-term affordability to the property. Waterside was developed as a uh, 1,470 unit Mitchell Lama housing development in the 1970s with commercial, retail, office, and other accessory spaces. The original project is composed of two tax lots on land that has been reclaimed and the sponsor, Waterside Plaza LP, leases the site from the city under a 99-year lease that currently expires in 2069. Uh, prior to today's actions, the ground lease has been amended twice. Uh, in 2005, the development exited the Mitchell Lama program. At that time, in accordance with the settlement agreement, rental protections for approximately 450 tenants it's now called Settling Tenants. 2001. Two, oh, two, sorry, I will correct that. It is 2001, not 2005. Uh, today, under land use number 310, HPD seeks an extension of the ground lease through an urban renewal disposition, and under land use number 311, HPD is seeking the First Amendment to the Urban Renewal Plan to extend its duration an additional 47 years, which will allow for a total unexpired term of 99 years, coterminous with the ground lease extension. This will facilitate the preservation of the affordability of 325 rental units. Uh, through the ground lease extension, the city worked closely with Councilmember Powers and the Waterside Tenants Association to negotiate rent protections for the settling tenants. For tenants with household incomes over 165% of area median income, future rent increases will be either 2.25% or the Rent Guidelines Board recommendation, whichever is higher, not to, see, not to exceed 4.25%, which is current uh, increase amount. Tenants with household incomes below 165% of area median income will be eligible for a rent freeze where rents grow at 0% percent annually for the duration of tenancy. Additionally, tenants with household incomes below 165 percent of AMI and who are also rent burdened or paying more than 30 percent of gross income and in rent will receive a rent equivalent of 30 percent of their income. Tenants will have a defined window to certify their rent. Tenants who expect to retire later in 2019 after the certification period will be able to indicate that and receive the rent reset when that happens. Additionally, any household with an income over 165 percent of area median income at initial income in certification 
certification will be eligible for the rent freeze at any point in the future if the household income goes below 165% of AMI. After an apartment is vacated by a settling tenant, the unit will be entered into the city's housing lottery. These apartments will be governed by the regulatory agreement, restricting rents to an average of 120% AMI, where half of the units are 110% AMI and half of the units are 130% of AMI, where uh, rents will increase based on standard federal income formulas. In addition to affordability protections, the owners have agreed to provide accessibility accommodations to assist seniors settling tenants to continue to age in place, including grab bars and bathrooms, seats in the shower, easy to grip kitchen bathroom hardware, faucets that are easy to use, cabinet handles that a finger can wrap around easily, handheld shower head for use when sitting, uh, and where practicable based on safety consideration, building code requirements, cost and structural constraints, bathroom doors on hinges that make it swing outward, install inclines over lintels between rooms, modification of interior door ways to facilitate wheelchairs and easy to grip lever handles on doors. Um, I want to thank both Councilmember Powers and the Waterside TA for their advocacy and partnership on this deal. Uh, Councilmember Powers has pushed us every step of the way to get to where we are today uh, and we're thankful for such a particularly productive working relationship here. Uh, and I think we will now, I don't think we have testimony from the sponsor so we are now you know, happy to take questions. I'll now turn to Councilmember Powers to ask the first round of questions. Thank you, and, and thank you for that testimony. And uh, minus the one glitch in the year, I agree with everything in there. Um, I and I appreciate the the comments, and I, I again would note that I think it's been uh, a collaborative effort that has taken a lot of a lot of time to put together. But of course, I, as you know, that part around what do people do when they retire in the coming years as they face it has been really the critical issue here. Um, and so I wanted to just ask an initial question here, which is that as we hear, and you will hear from many of the residents who are still working, but will experience a reduction of income upon retirement, whether that's today, but really beyond 2019, uh, many are close to retiring age and you know, would like to keep working, but wouldn't actually be eligible for their own reduction uh, on their current income. One improvement we made on that, an improvement in my eyes, is that we allowed that window to go until the end of 2019, and I am very grateful for providing that flexibility for those right there. Um, I think that, you know, my review on this is that the deal recognizes the importance of taking rent burden into account, which I think we rarely do, is to say it should be at a certain value, but we don't, we don't account for that versus your AMI. Um, can you just talk to us about why 2019 is the end year for the for the deal and why uh, those who are here today who feel very passionate about um, their community uh, are, are um, see 2019 as the end year for the rent uh, reset? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Uh, we, uh, for the last really, I'd say two years, have been um, having conversations with ownership and, and Councilmember Powers and the Tenant Association about this. Um, and, and our um, stance is that, you know, we recognize that there might be a short window by which people maybe weren't quite planning to retire, um, but uh, that, you know, it, it was too short of a duration for someone to make that, uh, that plan. Um, but to leave it open-ended um, into the future is really uh, inequitable with all the other affordable housing that HPD finances. Um, nowhere else do we allow for fluctuations in a tenant's income to impact the rent that they um, pay other than when there's federal subsidies available. Um, so allowing for a buffer to the end of 2019 was our attempt to try and uh, allow a little bit of flexibility for tenants that may be retiring very soon uh, without uh, being so inconsistent with the rest of the affordable housing uh, that HP finances, which is you know, many thousands of households every every year. And are, are there other deals that you've done maybe in, re in recent years that have accounted for rent burden as part of the deal? Uh, no. I mean, typically in a preservation project when we're uh, financing it, either through tax um, or through, through a, a subsidized loan, um, if, if there is going to be a rent restructuring or if there are tenants that are rent burning, we will try to get Section 8 vouchers into that project. But nowhere else are we just changing um, you know, what people's rent are based on 30% of their income. So this deal would be setting a, setting a standard around rent burden that you don't normally don't say, I'm not saying creating new precedent here, but I, but I understand. So we, this is new in the terms of including rent burden as a factor into a 
HPD deal. Is that correct? Uh, we we again we you know if there's a project that has rent burden, we will try to alleviate that through providing Section 8 vouchers. However, nowhere else are we able to provide this type of relief, um, and it's really because of the ground lease with the city that we're able to do that, mm. um, which is not a tool that we have widely available because most land is is privately owned. And so in this instance, uh, we are able to be helpful and recognize that this is a group of folks that have been living there for at least 18 years um, and really got a, a, a not great deal when it came out of Mitchellama and trying to um, provide some relief to make up for the seven and a quarter percent and then four and a quarter percent increases over the last 18 years. Um, and can you, are there other deals that you've done if they're HPD that have included ground lease with the city or in recent, maybe the last three years? Uh, no. 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 So this is not, unique not in the I'm sense aware. that it, there's a ground lease and so there, that is with the city, that's not an, it, that's atypical? It, yeah. Most of the projects that we finance are not on ground leases with the city. Um, and, and this is one where it is and where it's not, you know, has not been affordable housing, not been regulated affordable housing for, for 18 years. Um, and there are, you know, this, this uh, group of tenants that's been in place um, for the duration and, and that has no longer become affordable for many of them. And so that's why um, when, when the ownership approached us about extending the ground lease that we really made sure to try and provide affordability and, and protections for as many of those tenants as possible. And, and can you tell us about other deals in, in maybe in recent years that you're familiar with that had both this long-term affordability aspect of preserving unit? Like I, where I live in Stuyvesant Town, a, a deal that helped, I think, prevent evictions but didn't help, didn't do tenant stuff right now, but um, was about long-term affordability of Stuy Town. Uh, not to compare them. Well, Stuy Town's a wonderful place. But, uh, but, um, but this one has both the tenant protections and the long-term affordability. Can you tell us other deals that you have that have coupled those two things together? So we frequently uh, will, will uh, in doing a preservation project, um, particularly if we're using Article 11 tax exemption as an example, there'll be tenants that... Um, are either not rent stabilized or that um, have preferential rents. And so as a part of those types of transactions, we'll require that the owner re either for the first time stabilize or re-stabilize units at what that tenant is currently paying. However, it's never around right sizing to 30% of their income. Again, that's really uh, been unique to this project to address tenants that are, are rent burden. Um, and then on those types of projects, they'll also have long-term rent restrictions. So when those existing tenants leave uh, for whatever reason, it would be re-rented at a, a affordable rent level for that neighborhood. And, and can you tell us how 75 years was kind of the chosen amount to, for the years for the long the preservation of the unit? Yeah, uh, it was really a negotiated point between ownership and us. Um, the city was pushing for it to be the full 99 year term. Um, ownership didn't want to, to agree to that, and so we landed at 75 years. However, typically a property on a ground lease will need to get a renewal of that ground lease to get financing well in advance of 75 years. So we feel that the city should have another uh, crack at this. At Sometime the, uh, in the 75 years, exactly. I'm ahead in the job. Long, long, uh, okay. long, yeah, long after none of I, us are here. I think that, you know, I, 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 um, I think w the part of my questions here is to say this deal is so, I mean, first of all, very grateful. It's, I think it is a. I think it is a deal that breaks ground in a number of different places. I feel like if we're going to break ground uh, once, we should do it twice and three. Then I think we should really try to take into account uh, the folks that live there and are facing imminent retirement and feel like um, this is the chance they have to make this deal meaningful for them. And again, what I said earlier was if we are going to, in many cases, put people back into a lottery, we might as well skip that process. And we should uh, put, let them stay right in their homes with with protections around this for the city to make sure we're not running rampant uh, around that. But with the limited amount of people that I think are affected here, um, I feel like let's make it the most unique deal we can possibly make. And, um, and, the, and the set of circumstances dictating this one with the lease and other things here, and a and I, and honestly, a, a good neighbor as a, a good uh, a good management company that's willing to to you know consider these things that we should be really at a point of um, pursuing the the best deal here. Um, you know, I think we uh, certainly hear you loud and clear. Um, and have certainly heard from a uh, tenants association and I think are sympathetic to the concern moving forward. Um, I think from our perspective, adding in an additional reset down the line creates, uh, I think, you know, Jeremy spoke a little bit to some of the policy concerns, but also quite a bit of uncertainty, I think for both the city and for ownership, uh, that would be very difficult for us to execute on. Um, but I think, you know, 
as an agency, we are committed to ensuring that Section 8 will be available, assuming Section 8 continues to be available, um, that Section 8 will be available for tenants who qualify for those programs or for other city programs, um, but definitely, you know, hear the request and look forward to continuing those conversations. And could, what is the uncertainty? You said the uncertainty for the city? Uh, I think the, I mean, the uncertainty is that we, the household income for residents retiring in three, five, eight, you know, any number of years is not actually a known quantity. I think people might, you know, have a sense of what that could look like, but it's not, it's not certain. And so I think it would be hard for us to actually be able to execute on something. Meaning you would not be able to finance the deal appropriately or put the subsidy in without understanding how many folks would be. We need, yeah, we, in order to, and you know, folks should jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in order for us to actually close the deal, we need to have some certainty about, you know, what is to come and what rents and incomes are going to look like and what, you know, all of that is. So I think it, it creates a problem for us. Um, but again, here you and certainly want to figure out ways to protect uh, tenants who, again, may income qualify for programs like Section 8 moving forward. Right. I just want to be on the record. I, I understand the Section 8 part. I don't think that captures everybody that we're talking about. I think it could capture many people we're talking about who would be over, I think it's 50 percent. What, what is it? What is the cap? What is the eligibility for Section 8? percent of AMI. Fifty percent. I think we're going to have a lot of people who are affected here who are not going to be into that category, and we're talking about rent burden more than AMI here. And I think that's the point that you're going to hear from many people is that or the burden of the rent after is going to be the problem more than AMI. But I, but I understand. Um, can you talk about? Um, so one of the conversations we have is about what would be used as income. Like what is what is the AMI calculate? Uh, other pro housing programs calculate household income as the adjusted gross income. More tenants would be able to receive benefits if you calculate it that way. And I know that's been a request that's been made about what is the number, I guess what column on the on your tax uh, 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 taxes you use. Um, can you talk to us why gross income is the the uh, measurement here for this for the deal? Yeah, I think. Um I, I think that the program you're uh, mentioning is SCREE, uh, which is not an HPD administered program. I think for all HPD financed units, we use the same income definition, which are defined in our marketing guidelines, and a lot of them are come from HUD requirements. Um, we cannot negotiate around definition of income on a project by project basis. And um, can we, okay, so the, um, and I know that many folks here have felt like that would make them eligible in parts of this program that don't. So I, I support flexibility there to allow it. Um, you, we have to do it as part of the deal. You have to do an income certification for every single individual. I know that we that process is uh, underway in terms of identifying a partner. Just a basic question: Why does an HPD and Department of Finance do that process on their own versus having requiring the owner to go out and hire a nonprofit or, or for-profit to do that? So the, the only um, type of, of unit or household that we do internal HPD income certifications for is Section 8, and that's because we're federally mandated to do that calculation on an annual basis. Um, outside of that, for all of the affordable housing that we finance, um, the ownership, uh, either themselves or, or their property management company or a marketing agent, um, is hired, uh, depending on the circumstances, to do the marketing process. Um, HPD then does check files on the back end um, of that, but for us to internally uh, be doing income certifications for the you know, many, 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 many thousands of people every year uh, would not be feasible. Okay, uh, it just strikes me that like that should be a pro that could be a process you could inherit. Not to we'd have to fund you for it, obviously, but uh, the process of finding a group seems to be a strenuous process, and certification becomes key to the. I, I think it's strenuous only because this is sort of a sui generis project, um, with a very uh, large resource need in the beginning of the process. But I think we'll have somebody in place within a week or two. Okay. Thank you. Um, for, so just going to go through some logistics here on the deal. For, for a tenant to take advantage of the rent freeze, um, will their income, ha so that it means that if you, for instance, if you are up below, above 165% AMI and you, your income drops, that is one area where if you retire or have a significant change in income, you can take advantage of a different part of the deal. Um, 
your what is the process by which you have to um, uh, take advantage of the rent freeze, and what is the period of time you need to be below 165 percent AMI in order to be eligible for that? So uh, this is something we're going to have to uh, work out the details with and ownership with the um, certification agent that they um, contract with. But um, broadly speaking, for someone that's applying for affordable housing, it's really you know their most recent recent um, uh, pay stubs um, that would you know, be the, the proof of, of, and also a note from their employer about what, um, uh, what their current income is. So there's not a fixed period of time, but you know, it can be a pretty short window that their income would need to be at that level. So, to apply so if I'm at 165% AMI or greater, my income dips below, I should be going to see the certification agent when it dips below and bringing pay stubs and tax returns and so forth exactly. at, the, at the moment where it drops below 165. Yeah. As soon as a tenant feels that their income is below 165% of AMI, they should initiate the process. And what about tenants who have fluctuation? Uh, again, as soon as someone you know feels like their income is below 165, they should initiate the process. Okay, thanks. Um, what is the process for the retirement reset for 2019? Uh, the the way it's going to work is that a if a tenant uh, is not retiring yet and will be retiring later in the year in 2019. Uh, at the point of income certification, they would both certify their income as of that moment, as well as their anticipated income when they'd be retiring that year. Um, and then once they do in fact retire, they would submit an affidavit to ownership saying, I've retired and, and my income is what I said it was, and they would get the rent reduction at that moment in time. Got it. And is it fair to say that there is some uncertainty in the amount of people that will take advantage of that this year? Yeah, we, I mean, until the certification process starts, we don't, we won't know. I, we know what, what Janet and the Tenant Association have told us based on some um, some, some surveys and polling that they've done amongst themselves, but we obviously won't have a fixed idea until that process starts. Which raises the question of, we don't know the, but, uh, we have uncertainty but, in that part of the deal as but well. We, but we will, by the time we execute the ground lease and all this goes into effect, we will know because they will have certified that they're retiring and what the days they're retiring and what their income will be before we. And I, I think just to piggyback on that, I think we expect that if you are saying early in 2019 that you're going, this is going to be your retirement income within the same year, I think there is, you know, a, le a, a much smaller chance that something is going to change the circumstances of that than if you were saying in 2019, five or eight years down the line, this is how my income might change. I understand, but I just want to note that there, I think there's uncertainty in that. There's a category of people that will be go from rent the over 165 and down and take on the, the, um, the will it take advantage of the rent freeze. Like I think this deal actually sets up very well for people to be able to go down if there if there's a change in income or rent burden. And I think that it makes it has been part of the reason, in addition to the stories about why I'm convinced that a second reset would be allowable with. Uh, of course, appropriate protections, not 70, maybe not 75 years, but within a certain time frame that somebody who's facing retirement beyond 2019 would have the opportunity to take advantage of the deal because not everybody can plan out this year for their retirement. Some people are on a pension and think 2020 is the year. And so I, I will continue to advocate for people to be able to take advantage of this beyond 2019, all, all parts of it. I certainly am grateful for where we are today. Um, and so can I, if certification were begin tomorrow, when would tenants start receiving the first benefits of the deal? So we uh, anticipate that um, if the ULERT process is finalized, that it'll take around three months to do income certifications and with the ground lease amendment occurring at the end of that. So we would expect in May to be executing the ground lease amendment and that immediately uh, is when tenants would be receiving the, the new. And why in three months is for? Uh, it'll take about that long to, for us, our legal team, to close the deal. There's kind of customary uh, due diligence that needs to occur in order to get the deal finalized between at the end of ULERP and when we can execute a ground lease. So just to, sorry, say again, just an estimate. When does it? When does it would it take place? When would people first be able to take advantage of the deal if it passed? Our our current goal is 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 May. May. Okay. Has there been any consideration of allowing people to take advantage of the deal immediately, even though rather than waiting three months to be able? I, I actually am seriously concerned. I don't. I, I don't know. If it's, but I think there are some people who are in a situation where this deal is really important to them and really would help them. And three months would create a 
uh, you know, a situation where they'd be have to figure out a difficult financial situation with their rent in order to be able to take advantage of them. Yeah, um, until we execute the ground lease, we can't mandate anything. I defer to ownership about if there's any anything that they feel like they can do. I mean, if there are particular hardship cases, we should successfully we'll discuss them. What's that? Sorry. Then? If there are particular hardship cases, we should discuss them. Okay, so you're willing to talk about anybody who's got a particular hardship case. Okay, I am. I have heard from some tenants who I feel like this deal is matters imminently. So I appreciate you be willing to work with those folks. And I, I will say one of the reasons I think this deal is really important is because of those stories I've heard directly from constituents who are who are um, struggling to meet that that ratio between income and rent. Um, can you tell us the unit distri the unit distribution or apartment mix? of the 325 units that are a part of this deal? So Waterside has studios through three bedrooms. Uh, the 325 breaks down 16% uh, studios, 34% one bedrooms, 40% two bedrooms, and 10% for three bedrooms, which is very similar to the unit mix of the complex as a whole. So the deal is supposed to be sort of representative of the units that are there today? So the complex as a whole is instead of 16% for studios, complex we have 19% of studios. Use a, can you use the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Waterside has, of the 1,471 units, Waterside has 38% one bedrooms. The unit mix for the 325 is 34%. For two bedrooms, the the complex wide percentage is 34 percent, while the 325 is 40 percent, and uh, three bedrooms is exactly the same at 10 percent. Okay, and just going down the the route about um, I want to talk about downsizing a little bit, which is part of this deal. You have to be right size in your apartment in order to take advantage of parts of the deal. Can you just just can you give us a definition of right sizing? So if for instance if a household of two people or a married couple has a two bedroom apartment, is that considered appropriately housed for the rent reset? So I think, you know, under Section 8 guidelines, my understanding is that a two-bedroom for a married couple is not considered appropriately housed. I think we still have some work to do internally to figure out what's going to happen on this deal. Good. And but I appreciate I certainly that. understand the request and are working through what is, you know, partially legally possible. Okay. And so that is uh, an area being discussed. I think that as some of the tenant tenants understood it previously, that wasn't considered right-sized for, um, for this particular deal. So we would look forward to a some clarity on that. Um, and then some tenants will have to move down to a smaller apartment to be considered appropriately housed. Others want to move down or up voluntarily to take advantage of a different rent number or a different size apartment. Um, can you tell us about how move, up, move downs and move ups will be prioritized during this process, how that process will work? If somebody voluntarily wants to move down, how does that relate to somebody who reluctantly has to because of the terms of the deal? No, because it hasn't all been worked out. Um, but uh, Waterside has every intention to begin the voluntary move down and ups um, well before execution of the ground lease. Um, the methodology of that mo process, I think the TA and Waterside will work out through in the next weeks. Um, I know the TA has a particular process that they favor. So we'll listen to that and, 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 we'll, and as usual, we'll make a deal. Okay. We would um, love to have that conversation sooner than later to make sure that as we are looking at this deal, we have a clarity for all the tenants who might be affected by that about exactly what their situation might be. And I think there's good reasons to do voluntary or involuntarily first, but, um, but I know that there's some people who want to take advantage of the deal in different ways. So well, I mean, the, 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 the voluntary move down does, it's not really done pursuant to the ground lease. So we can do that before the ground lease is executed. So that sort of dictates we do that first. Okay. Um, succession rights on the apartments, are there, succession, are there, are there succession rights for uh, anybody who is living in an apartment today as part of this deal? As a part of the settlement agreement, yes, but not as a part of this deal. So what happens if you have a child or a family member who wants to uh, take advantage of the succession rights here? Like, well, what, if you're in the deal, to, if you take advantage of the deal that's being discussed today, what, what is the, um, a family member then able to take advantage of if they, you were they, they will they will um, succeed to the lease in the same apartment as their parents if that's the relationship, 
and um, their uh, lease will be governed by the settlement agreement, not the regulatory agreement. So they will be able to succeed, but they will then be a settling tenant back to what the agreement is today versus Correct. a take advantage of it. Okay. Um, if Waterside is sold in the future, does this deal uphold? And what if, if are there parts of it that will not be kept in place as a result of a sale or transfer of ownership? 100% that any future owner would be bound by this deal. HPD agrees with that? Yes. Okay. Are there any parts of it that would not be, they would not be bound to? No, it'll all be a part of the ground lease. And, okay. and our, our legal team is still figuring out the, the exact mechanics of the legal documents, but any, any future owner would be bound. Okay. Um, and I want to I want to stop some questions there to offer the chair an opportunity. And I, he was nice enough to let me go before him in this case. Um, just can you tell us tell us in terms of this agreement we have here today, how does it serve as a model for other deals in the city moving forward? Yeah. What you know from our perspective we feel like we were able to exercise a lot of creativity um, and, and, and within the, the constraints of the tools that we had. Um, we don't have the same set of tools on other projects, but the creativity that exists therein, um, the ability to preserve housing um, is, is something that is absolutely our priority and uh, that we feel really good about on this project and really happy that we were able to work uh, collaboratively on this with you um, and, and would apply that same methodology and approach to preserving affordable housing in all five boroughs. Um, so I will, I will, I may have another round of questions, but I, I will defer to the, the chair at this point. And I, I first want to thank everybody again who's worked on this. I also want to thank my staff who's been sitting and working uh, on this for a very, very long time. I want to I also should note my predecessor, Dan Garodin, who actually kickstarted this process and gave me an opportunity then to, to take advantage of um, a conversation that started. I want to, he's not here, but I, I want him to know that I'm, uh, I'm thankful uh, for his work to, you know, have this conversation at the outset. Um, it's Can I just uh, cut in and say I should have included that in my remarks as that's well? That's okay. Not that you used to work for him or anything. Um, uh, uh, I think we're, we're very grateful for, for Dan's work and to uh, former Lieutenant Governor Dick Ravage as well for their work. I, I um, you know, over the course of this conversation have, um, you know, really been convinced that this deal is a win for the, the tenants but have been convinced that the deal that the tenants have been asking for in its form or some form like it would really truly be a victory uh, for, the, for the city and for the tenants because we would be um, not doing, as I said, put, putting people into the housing lottery at a future part of time, watching them watch their house go up into a housing lottery while they're searching for their own apartment. And I've talked to a lot of the tenants and I will say, this is, this is a pretty well organized tenants association and one that advocates very hard for themselves. And as you know, and they are doing it not because they want a better deal than anybody else in the world. They want to do it because they want to live in Waterside and they see it as their home. And I am, I uh, will say, even as I felt very proud of this deal, and I think it was 200 to nothing that the Tennis Solution supported it, they, su they supported it and they supported me advocating for them, I think with the major asterisk that we didn't stop pushing for a deal that would let everybody retire right there in Waterside and call it their home. So I know you certainly understand that and I and I, I know that you have empathy for for their, for those who are facing an uncertain future. I will ask, and I will not continue to ask, and I know my colleagues, I should recognize Senator Hoyleman and Assemblymember Epstein and all, again, Senator President Brewer, who have all made calls to, to um, repeat that, that we feel like this is a good deal, but a great deal looks like one where people can call us their home with no uncertainty for the future. And, um, and you will hear from that for me a lot in the next in the next week or two. So um, I want to give the chair an opportunity to advocate uh, to, to ask questions. I want to give the tenants an opportunity to advocate for themselves. Um, I do th I do I am very thankful for the hours that have been put in on everybody who's on this panel today because um, it's been a lot of back and forth and some extensions of 2019 and so forth. I think we can get to a place where we can do more and um, I, I'm hope I'm really very very hopeful and I will be advocating to make this the best deal that we can make it. So, thank you. I want to thank Councilmember Powers for his exhaustive questions and advocacy. Uh, these committee hearings tend to run pretty quick, and uh, I haven't had anyone ask more questions than I do. So, uh, it's good to share that uh, with folks. Uh, 
in terms of the developer on this project, what is the corporate entity with which this deal is being made? The corporate entity is called Waterside Plaza Grand Lessee LLC. And is that the landlord or is there a secondary corporation to which uh, the ground lessee leases? Uh, that's, that's the entity that owns the ground lease. So I don't and know. And then who do the tenants who do the tenants make their checks out to? Ground lessee. Okay. Uh, I understand that there have been capital improvements. Are there any capital improvements that are planned as part of this project? Well, not as part of the regulatory agreement, except for the um, accommodations we're going to be doing for folks who need them. But Waterside is planning to uh, replace all of its windows. Uh, replace all of its PTAC units, um, replace all of its corridors, redo its lobbies. But that's outside of the regulatory agreement. Correct. Assuming that the city, sorry, that the state does not eliminate the major capital improvement loophole, will the improvements you just mentioned have an impact on rents for the settlement tenants? Waterside has never taken an MCI as far as I know. That is good to know. Uh, that would make you one of the most unique developers in what is. But we don't really have a, I mean, there is language in the settlement agreement that would permit us to, under emergency circumstances, uh, take sort of a, a contractual MCI, not a statutory MCI, but we've never attempted to do that. You mentioned uh, with the uh, council member powers, the makeup of the units as members are downsized, will the three-bedroom units, still will there still be 10% of the three bedrooms set aside, or will you end up with a windfall of, oh, people got downsized, now you have more three bedrooms that you will be able to rent for more? Yeah, uh, when, when people move down, then the units that they move down to will, will constitute the part of the 325 units. How much commercial square footage do you have on the site? About 65,000 square feet. Uh, do you have a supermarket on site? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, my, my neighbors here would say no, but yes, we have a Christine's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I appreciate the honesty. Are there currently any DOB violations on the site, A, B, or C? Um, yeah, I, I, there are some, there, there was a de minimis, more than de minimis paint um, peeling in our stairways in, in 40 building. They required a lead test, which we did, which was negative, but for some reason um, they're, they're asking us to redo those tests, and I'm not sure why, so we're trying to work through that. I'm sure you can work with your local member. Uh, I think if you saw the previous hearing, the piece that I try to just get to, and to just start this off, uh, Dick Ravitch is kind of a legend in the state. Uh, he saved the MTA as Lieutenant Governor. He did a great job, and he's always there with the right financial answers to rescue our city. So I, I feel that if, and a lot of the questions I ask in this committee are because Dick Ravitch was so on top of the numbers when he was at the MTA and other places that he's constantly letting me know about where the city could be saving capital dollars, what we could be doing to save. So that, that is the spirit that I kind of do this, and I feel, I'm concerned that the uh, former lieutenant governor might not, what, might, would respect me less if I didn't ask the, all, all these tough questions. Uh, I think the big piece is on the last item that was testified to, which was a $65 million project. The city disclosed that there was 45% of it was being subsidized by the city. And so I guess the, the big question I'm curious about is, what does the per unit subsidy look like on this project? Uh, that, that's all the only question I've ever really been <laughs> interested in. We usually get into the weeds on things out of my habit uh, over, over the year that I've been chair. So as a, a part of this project, we are uh, keeping the ground lease at 85% of the full tax bill 
for the 75 years of the affordability restrictions. Um, and so that kind of 15 percent uh, reduction of full taxes um, is about uh, four, 45 million dollars um, in, in today's dollars, which is about $113,000 per affordable unit. Okay. Uh, so the net present value is $45 million. Yep, that's correct. And uh, are there other city subsidies? The only other city subsidy is the, the ground lease that has been in place for uh, since the 70s um, and, and is being extended as a part of this land use action. Is there a value on that ground lease? Uh, we, we don't have a value for that ground lease. Are, is there financing from HDC or HPD otherwise? No. Are there state dollars otherwise? Not to my knowledge. Wait one second. Any? F no. Is there an HDC mortgage? No. Uh, low income housing tax credits? No. Uh, any city, city capital? No. Okay. The, the, and then in terms of the work that is done on your site, uh, you, you may have heard, I, I care a lot. So, so to, to, does your building have building service workers? Are there people who, who operate at the entrances to the buildings? We have 63 uh, SEIU 32BJ building workers. I think we're one of the largest single sites in the city of New York. In addition to that, um, we were asked and we granted SEIU the ability to uh, bring uh, their union into our security officers company so that we have 25 union security officers who aren't actually employees of Waterside, but, for, you know, but they are here. Okay, so to be clear, do those employees earn more than the minimum wage? Do they have health insurance? Do they have disability insurance? Do they have a defined benefit pension? Uh, do they have the right to worker protections? They have the full protection of the 32B building uh, workers contract, yes. Okay. Uh, with regards to uh, Waterside, the Waterside Plaza ground lessee and its subsidiaries, uh, are you an MWBE or do you work with MWBEs or are there minority and women in the management and executive positions? Um, we don't work with M WMBs uh, per se. Uh, our staff, I would say we have six um, divisions. Two are minority run, Three are women run, and then there's me. I might say, uh, Councilman, that Waterside Plaza is perhaps the most diverse community in New York City with over 80 countries represented, and our staff reflects that. Along those lines, what is the AMI, could you estimate the AMI for your current tenants? So not necessarily the 300 who don't have to share their income, but you have 1,100 market rate, uh, if you could share what you believe the AMI is to be of your market rate tenants. I, I apologize, but I've never done that exercise. Okay, uh, and, and the reason there is just similar to the previous build uh, project, just trying to get a sense out. Uh, whether or not the 110 to 130 percent AMI threshold is the right threshold for uh, this part of the city. Uh, so would you be willing to share that with the uh, local council member? Of course. Great. Uh, to be clear, what am I sharing with the councilman <laughs> since I'm getting some pushback here? Sure. So we're just looking at what are the what's the current incomes of people in the building, uh, in the market rate units. What is what is the market rate for your building, and so that we can compare the 110 to 130 percent to see if that's below, above, at market rate, so on and so forth. I'm sorry, I wasn't sure that they had that information. 
they apparently do have that and would share that. Not on. An I would love to apply to a market rate building that didn't want every single part of my income information from now and going to when I was born. People that have been there a long time. Not asking here. about the 309 settlement tenants. And we, we also have t uh, market rate tenants who've been here for a very long time, so we can use their initial incomes. That That is helpful. Uh, those that goes, and, and so the tax abatement is through a pilot, and that pilot is a 15% savings, uh, which comes out to 45 million net present value. I will now go to recognize Council Member Chaim Deutsch. Thank you, thank you, Chair. So uh, let me go back to 2001. Um, so my first question is, why did uh, Michelama, why did they opt out um, of the, the program? And what benefits did uh, the tenant have, the tenants have after the program, after what they opted out? And what was the difference between before um, they opted out and after? The reason that the project left the Michelama program was that <clears throat> under the Michelama program, as you probably know, there are all kinds of restrictions, rent setting requirements, and what have you. And since there was no requirement uh, that we stay in Michelama, uh, there was an advantage to the ownership um, to uh, to exit to exit the program. Um, and. Um, but during the course of that exit, there were expressions of concern by the existing tenants, obviously. Uh, some of them got Section 8 vouchers uh, if they were eligible at that time, and others did not. Um, and uh, a special settlement agreement was reached with all those existing tenants. That's what we keep referring to as the settling tenants, to provide them certain uh, benefits uh, one of those benefits was that there was a cap on rent increases, which turned out to be a rather high cap. Um, and as a result, a number of, well, in the, it was a different environment, a different inflationary environment in, that, in those years. As a result, the, the ownership agreed voluntarily to amend the settlement agreement later to lower that cap to 4%. So who is the ownership when you refer to ownership? Uh, the, there's an ownership that, that is led by, uh, by Mr. Ravitch. Uh, and uh, and other people, is that the tenants association? No, that's no. That, so that's so the ground while, lessee. That's the ground lessee. So while it was in uh, Michelama, in the Michelama program, so who who do you refer to ownership? Same the ownership has never changed since this building was built. So before when it was still in the Michelama program, what were like the basic rents of these apartments, and the increases? Let's say a one I, I apologize. I just don't have that information on me. Yeah. Uh, you don't approximately. I mean, is anyone here from the ownership? Well, I, yeah. I represent ownership, but um, so if you represent ownership and it's the same ownership from when it was in the Michelama program, you don't have those numbers. Not. It was, not. It was 18 years ago. We could find those, but we Bef so that's before 2001. Like, how much would a one bedroom go for? We, we, we don't know. We could check and let you know. We don't know. Um, so what is the process of opting out of the Michelama program? You have to... Do you have that with you? The, the, there's a process of, yeah. uh, of going to HPD and indicating that, uh, that you want to... Uh, exit the program. And there are certain rules that HPD has to facilitate that process. We followed those rules and and left the Mitchell Alva program. Do the tenants have a decision in opting out of the program? No. No. So who makes that decision? Is it the, the board? The, o the owner. The owner. So it's one person who makes that decision, or it's a corporation, it's an LLC. What it's, is it? It's an LLC. So an LLC makes a decision on behalf of how many tenants? It makes a decision on behalf of itself as the owner. Yeah, but how many tenants were part of this program that were acting out? Well, there are 1,250 Four, units 1400, or 1,400 units. 1,400 units. So one, one individual in LLC makes a decision on behalf of 1,400 apartments. 1,400 apartments? Well, as I say, so they 1,400 make apartments is how many people? I don't know what the average So I have a 6,000, I have 1,600 apartments, and that's 6,000 people. 
in one of my Michelamas. Mm -hmm. So if you have 1,400, then you probably have about a little over 5,000 people or 5,000 individuals. I think it's probably closer to 3,500 at that time. 3,500. You had vacancies at that time? Uh, I, I can get that information to you. I don't have that. It's, I wasn't here then. Yeah, so if you have uh, 3,500 people, then one LLC makes a decision on behalf of 3,500 people, and those 3,500 people have no say whether you should not opt out or opt out of the program. Is that correct? That's correct. correct. That's correct. Um, so I, I'm quite concerned. I mean, this, um, this happens to be, I mean, you're already after the fact. This is two th back in 2001, and uh, you have a great council member who's cutting this great deal here that I was listening to. But I'm concerned because I have uh, 2,200 Michelin apartments in my district. And I fund them over the last five years, $6 million, so their rents don't get raised. And all the capital projects go through me, and I make sure that those um, Michelamas get funded from the city. Um, rightfully so, their, re their rent shouldn't be raised. Uh, that's what's affordable housing. That's, that's what we call affordable housing. But I'm concerned what type of precedence this would set in the future because when one person makes a decision and the tenants have no say in that, <coughs> now does anyone in the city, state, or federal level have a say in opting out of a Mitchell Lama program? No, to the extent that there are subsidies like Section 8 subsidies that uh, they may have something to say about it, but the, the, the vouchers that were provided to the low-income tenants at the time this exited Michelama were self-executing. They belonged to the tenants that occupied those units at that time, and when those tenants <coughs> vacated the units, the Section 8 went, went away, went, went with them. So, I mean, what I'm, what I'm seeing is that there's a flaw in this whole process um, because if one person makes a decision for all the tenants and their rents now are, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. This is something that you're telling us what's going to happen, but we have no say of when someone opts out of the program. So what could be done in the future that um, city, state, or fe in the federal level that they should have a say in a... LLC opting out of the Michelama program, and we're fighting each and every day to have affordable housing, and here it's so easy just to opt out of affordable housing. Who can answer that question? I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think this, to me at least, this conversation about Waterside, I think, is separate from overall goals around Michelama, since this pro this particular property exited the Michelama program a long time ago, and now we are dealing on a separate deal there. But I, you know, certainly think HPD and the city generally are always, you know, looking for ways to work with private property owners to achieve affordability. I think that's why we are before this committee so often in trying to find those deals. Um, but also happy to have any conversations with you about particular Michelamas of concern in your district. So this actually this sets a precedence throughout the city for other Michelamas. Is to, we all agree? Anyone agree with me? No, I mean, there have been many Michelamas uh, projects that have come out of Michelama, like this yeah. project. And it's generally done by owners on a case-by-case -case basis, depending upon where the, where the project is located, what the rents are they can achieve in the market, what kinds of loans they can get. There are lots of different factors. And in some cases, the city has um, cut deals with owners uh, where they voluntarily agreed not to come out of Michelama when they, when they could have. So that's just part of the nature of the conversation between private owners and the city. So what is the process after um, a, you opt out of a Michelama? So what happens with those apartments to the tenants are currently um, occupying? Is it stay to stay rental? No, I'm... If, uh, if a property was a, a rental Michelama and uh, constructed prior to 1975, so 74 or before, it would become rent stabilized. Waterside Plaza, unfortunately, was right on the cusp and, and, uh, and did not end up being a rent stabilized property. Post 74, uh, it would not have rent stabilization protections, unfortunately. Um, but, but, and would stay a rental as long as an owner maintains it as a rental property. So these apartments um, are remaining rentals? 
deferred ownership. Until, uh, yes, absolutely. So is until when? I don't understand when that. So these are all rentals. Yes. And the, for how many years will they stay rentals? Well, the owner has the the owner, the owner has, has the, the the owner has the right to kind of, uh, to do a co-op on on the site, um, in which case they would not be rentals any longer. So the owner can sell it to the person occupying that apartment. Correct. And what what price would that be? Is it market the, rate? The owner has never considered and has no plans to convert this property to a co-op or condo. So we've never right. even thought about it. But the owner can. Correct. And that would be the owner's decision to sell those co-ops. Correct. I will say that the 325 units that will be affordable for 75 years, HPD will have absolute discretion over whether the owner can convert them to co-ops. So they will stay as a rental no matter what, unless HPD decides and the owner requests for it to convert to cooperative. Yeah, we, okay. we, we agree. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Can, can I ask a follow-up on that? I, that's an unfamiliar thing to me. You're saying that if the owner decided that they wanted to convert, I, as, as, as we discussed and, and it was uh, has been my understanding, there's no exit out of this for 75 years to 2098 or 2100 um, uh, at, at all. It, it is, is what you're saying a different than that, my understanding of that, to say that the 325 units can be, can be taken out of the HBD in any way, the no. HPD agreement in any way? No, the only thing, I mean, at, at if they were to ask and we were to agree, they'd be allowed to convert these to limited equity, affordable cooperative units, but that would only be at our discretion. But our intention is not for these to be converting to anything other than rental, affordable rental as, as they are will be going forward. So what are, so let's just one step back. What are other ways that this could be taken out of the HPD agreement today? But that's, so that's not being taken out of, it would still be subject to the regulatory agreement. But the 325 units in that case would not be rentals anymore at the... They would be, if, if an owner approached HPD in the future about making them be affordable cooperative units, then we would, and, and the tenants would be able to remain in place as a non, as a renter, as long as they decide to, it would be a non-eviction plan. Got it, okay, thank you. I have, sorry, I have, sorry if that wasn't clear. No, I understand. I I just, I, I really want to get the tenants up, and I know there's limited time. We have another application behind this. So I'm just going to hit just four more questions, but they're quick. One is, is there any priority for local uh, either residents or neighbors in the housing lottery that would be put in place? Um, two is um, the number I think I have today is 308 settling tenants that are covered by this. 325 is the units. So you can tell it's just a discrepancy. You just explain the difference in the numbers. I think and, he's running through all the questions. And then three is, yes, I am. Uh, and three <laughs> is um, SCREE is not available here, but you can you compare SCREE as, L, as uh, made available in other neighboring neighborhoods uh, versus the rent freeze that's offered here, and which one is more generous? Yeah, I mean, so I'll start on the community preference. Um, you know, unfortunately, the HPD is engaged in litigation around the topic, um, so can't have, you know, super in-depth conversations about community preference. Um, so I, you know, my understanding is I think there would not be community preference in this deal. Uh, and then for the 325? Yeah, my, our understanding and ownership can confirm but that there is currently, we started this negotiation uh, a couple of years ago. At what point in time there was a higher number of selling tenants? Today I believe there's 308 remaining in place. However, the other uh, 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 17 units would be rented through Housing Connect. And I think as for I can, Do you know Scree? Yeah. So for Scree, uh, in, in can I can I just um, there were 14 units that that opted out of the settlement agreement over the course of the last 18 years. Um, we have every intention to allow them back into this deal. So you would have to add the 106 to the 14, so that means we'd have 320. Got it. And then five units would be rented through Housing right. Connect. And Scree. Uh, and then uh, SCREE uh, is available to seniors 62 and older that make less than $50,000 a year and have 33% rent burden um, and, and, so, and only available to tenants in rent stabilized units and Mitchell Lamas. 
Um, here, uh, we're, and, and it provides for a rent freeze, essentially, for the duration of their tenancy, where the city picks up the, the, the tab for any rent increases. Um, here, we're allowing a rent freeze for any tenant below 165% of AMI, which for a family of three, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, is, is about triple the $50,000 uh, income. Um, we're not limiting it to any specific age. Um, and uh, we're uh, allowing for rent burden at 30% uh, percent of a tenant's income instead of 33. So this will be 154935 Thank you so much, council member. So you can be eligible for a rent freeze at $154,000 here in a scree apartment, in, what is, in a rent stabilized apartment, what is it? $50,000. $50,000, $50, okay. Um, I'll just end on this note to say that number, that discrepancy between the 325 and the 308 today, I think reflects the idea that there are many folks who have been been trying to hang on and have had to leave, even since we started this conversation. Absolutely. So that number, to me, is very telling about what we're, what we're facing here. So um, uh, just, just a reminder about where I, I think we should be going in terms of the deal. Totally. And appreciate, I think, you have pushed us to move faster at every step of the process. Um, and appreciate you doing that and want to make sure your tenants understand that you have done that forcefully. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I want to make sure the tenants can get up. So thank you for all your time. Well, be before you go, I just want to jump on with, with Chaim. So it so happens that I have Mitchell Amas in my district, too, who have been exiting. Uh, and I also have the uh, Urban America portfolio on Roosevelt Island with 1,001 units. Uh, you've done something unique here. In my district, two or three years ago, HPD said that because Roosevelt Island is a unique situation, Very unique. HPD, which has jurisdiction of the city of New York, was not interested in doing preservation of 1,000 units on Roosevelt Island. Is that now changing? I don't, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for, for uh, whoever you had the conversation with, but our issue there is that it's been mass released to a state agency, and that state agency uh, would, has the discretion to, to utilize the land as they so wish. So that, that is our unfortunate reality. That is the same answer we got before, but you can't blame me for trying. We'll <laughs> exclude this. We, we would love to do preservation there, not for lack of our desire on our part. It's, it's would you come sit at a table with me in urban America and see what we can do around the governor? I think we certainly can have that conversation. That would actually be quite meaningful. I'm going to excuse this panel. Uh, thank you. There's some follow-up that is owed to the council member. I'm going to ask Rurik Asher um, Bomrim. I'm sure that would be easier to read in, in, in Hebrew or, yes, uh, uh, from State Senator Brad Hoyleman's office. He has written testimony. Uh, and so I thank you. I imagine you're here to read a joint letter with uh, Assembly Member Epstein. Uh, I'm going to give you about 90 seconds. Please read the best parts of it. <laughs> okay. And then sure. we will get to the tenants who are the main event and will not have the 90 second time clock. Great. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Kalos and the subcommittee members for this hearing. Uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to submit testimony to this subcommittee regarding the applications by New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development for an amendment to the Waterside Urban Renewal Plan to extend the length of affordability for 325 residential units at Waterside Plaza and for the disposal of city property by renewing the existing 99-year lease of the Waterside Plaza development. As elected officials representing Waterside Plaza, we urge the subcommittee to support these applications. This proposal took many months to negotiate, and we thank our colleagues for their leadership on this important effort. City Council Member Keith Powers, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, HPD, Janet Handel, and the Waterside Tenants Association, Richard Ravitch, Peter Davis, and of course Community Board 6. Um, Waterside Plaza has provided housing for moderate and middle income families for more than four decades. Today's proposal would preserve this affordability for years to come and thus allow tenants to age within their own homes with the peace of mind and economic security that comes with having a predictably affordable place to live. This represents a stark contrast to other parts of Manhattan where many of our constituents have been pushed out of their homes due to rising rents. Since 1993, in fact, New York City has lost over 152,000. You skip to the third from the last paragraph. Thank you. As beneficial as the proposal is for most tenants at Waterside Plaza, there is always room for improvement. First, not all tenants will fully benefit from the retirement rent reset. 
While we are pleased that tenants who retire by December 31st, 2019 will have the opportunity to recertify their incomes to show they are rent burdened and qualify for a rent reduction, the retirement window could be expanded to benefit even more tenants. According to the Waterside Tenants Association, about 97 households will not be retiring by the end of 2019, and two-thirds of these households will eventually be severely rent burdened in retirement. Therefore, we think it reasonable and justified to allow tenants to recertify their income upon retirement after 2019. We suggest that the retirement rent reset benefit eventually be extended to include those who retire until the year 2026, as suggested by the uh, Waterside Tenants Association. Second, we would like to see this proposal reflect the WTA's request to permit the deduction of medical expenses when calculating household income, especially given rising health care costs for seniors. Third, we wish to see distributions from retirement accounts excluded from household income, since this would make HPD's policy consistent with that of the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, which does not count withdrawals from investment funds as income, so long as the amount withdrawn is a reimbursement of previously invested money. Notwithstanding, Last paragraph, go for Thank it. Thank you. Quick. Notwithstanding these concerns, these applications represent a rare opportunity to protect 325 units of housing from destabilization and provide housing security for tenants at Waterside Plaza. To date, the conversations between the parties involved here have yielded highly promising outcomes for tenants. We hope these negotiations can continue in the same spirit, and we strongly encourage you to approve these applications and replicate their terms elsewhere throughout the city for the benefit of even more New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our, uh, so it appears that we have 15 folks uh, testifying in favor of this project. Uh, typically we do two, so, so we would like to, so typically we do two minutes in many hearings. Sometimes council members ourselves have a two minute time clock. Uh, sometimes we do three minutes. We can also do no limit. Uh, there's a lot of folks here. There's 15 speaker, speakers signed up. So just show of hands, how many folks would like to do two minutes? And if nope, no one would like to do two minutes. Who would like to do three minutes? Okay, three minutes sounds fair. fair. And who would like to hang out here till tomorrow morning? Okay. So we're going to aim for three minutes. It's an honor system. Please just know that it is your friends and neighbors who will be waiting longer if you go over the three minutes. And please don't make me or somebody else be difficult about asking people to wrap up. We, we asked our, our state colleagues to move quickly. Our first panel is going to be uh, Janet Handel, president of the Waterside Tenants Association. I want to thank her for coming and joining me on Sunday for my state of the uh, district. Cheryl Kirkland, uh, who needed to leave by 2 o'clock. Is Cheryl still here? Cheryl left at 2 o'clock. Uh, and we apologize. Cheryl, if you are watching this or if anyone is, is anyone her neighbor? Uh, if you can just let her know she can submit testimony within 24 hours. Norma Davis. Come on up. Uh, pretzel Hedrun? Say, OK, you got it. So we're going to let Janet go six minutes. And then we have uh, Jay Mahler. Do we have Jay Mahler here? Do not see. He had to leave. OK, please tell Jay he can submit what he wanted to. Uh, Helena Ross. No worries, Janet. You get nine minutes. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Richard Cunningham. Do you want to join the panel? OK. Going to keep going to try to fill things up. Chris Spangler, would you like to testify? Uh, grab a seat. I'm going to call one more person to try to get us five people on the panel. We only have four chairs. We are, we are all set. I want to thank those who yielded their time. I will ask Janet to take as much time as you wish. For other folks, please just uh, try to honor three minutes. Please, uh, rather than repeating a point that's already been made, you can feel free to just say, I echo that sentiment, or plus one, or whatever your preference is. Uh, in the city council, we tend not to applaud. It's hard. I can tolerate, I, I'm fine with snaps. Uh, the thing that everyone does is jazz hands. Um, I think it looks silly, but uh, I do it nonetheless. 
so uh, you now you may now begin. No. If you want to, we can swear you in, but we typically only swear in the administration. And we've also extended it under my chairmanship to developers because I don't trust them. Please press the silver button so that the red light is on. OK, great. Good afternoon. I'm Janet Handel, president of the Waterside Tenants Association. I'm here today to discuss the 700 settling tenants living at Waterside Plaza in 309 apartments. Most of us have lived at Waterside for 30 to 40 years and raised families there. We moved there, when we moved there, it was a Mitchell Lama complex and the leases that we signed said that if the owner ex exited Mitchell Lama, we would become rent stabilized. That did not happen due to a certificate of occupancy technicality. As a result, since the exit in 2001, our rents have gone up 276%. While stabilized rents in the same time period have gone up only 86%, and real wage growth, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor uh, Standards, uh, has gone up only 59 percent. So our tenants have really been faced and squeezed by this. An apartment renting for two-bedroom apartment renting for $1,400 in 2001 now rents for $3,800. I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you have to have copies of your testimony that you? I did. Heard? I handed them. I only had one copy. Okay, we will have somebody from the committee staff make some copies for us. Oh, Thank sorry. you. Don't worry about it. If other folks have their testimony, just hand it to the folks and we'll make copies. Okay, great. We want Please to, continue. We are, and we don't need to do the clock for Janet. Okay. We are very grateful to the city, HPD, and the owner, uh, and to Peter Davis, the general manager, uh, that when we asked to be a part of the affordability plan for the property, we were included. We want to also thank Keith Powers and his predecessor, Dan Gorodnik, uh, for his really just energetic and unstinting support uh, and responsiveness to the tenants. He, his, he and his staff have been there every step of the way. They, they've taken a lot of phone calls. They understand people's situation. And I think that that's really helped inform his, his um, advocacy on, on our part. This deal will enable those of us already, already retired or retiring by the end of 2019 to age in place. That's about 80% of us. The deal freezes rent for those under 165 AMI and for those that are paying more than 30% of their income on rent, reduces their rent to 30% of income. Uh, it's a terrific deal and we voted unanimously to support it, but we also said we want it to be a little bit better. We want everybody living there to be able to age in place. Um, and as I said, it's about 80%, 20% of our households will still be working beyond 2019. So it was like 30% when we surveyed people were still working and about 20% of those 30% will be retiring and able to adjust their schedules to retire by 2019. But that still leaves 20% who will be working beyond 2019. That, that's 65 households. 80% um, of these people are 60 years or older. These are not people in their 30s and 40s. And 50% are over the age 65. You might ask, you know, well, why don't they retire now, you know, so that they can take advantage of this great deal? And the simple answer is they can't afford to retire yet. Some are taking care of adult special needs children. That's the situation of Cheryl Curland, who had to leave early. They have two special needs adult children that they are supporting. Some are supporting parents in their 90s. Some are still digging out after the crash of 2008, and others have their children's college loans and other obligations that need to be repaid. These are middle-income New Yorkers who have worked hard their entire lives, paid taxes, and not relied on the city to take care of their problems. These are the very people that the mayor talked about when he said, if you're a senior trying to remain in the neighborhood that you helped to build, we are fighting to help you stay. When we asked him about this, uh, and to include uh, those seniors still working at his town hall in, in December, his answer was, we want to find a way to do this. And so, you know, what I want to point out now is that, that, you know, the people that are still working are middle income now, most of them, but when they retire, two-thirds will become low income, making low, less than 80% of AMI, and will be paying more than 50% of their income for rent. They are known as severely rent burden. 
these people at this number are at high risk of homelessness. Rent burden is the biggest predictor of homelessness, uh, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. They will be forced to move from their homes of 30 or more years when they are at their most vulnerable in their 70s and 80s. I don't understand how it makes economic sense for the city to have these people forced out of their homes when they retire, only to be seeking affordable senior housing elsewhere in the city. Isn't it really cheaper and better to keep them in their homes? It's possible that HPD would like to include them in the plan, but they say that they, they just don't have the money to do that. They've offered Section 8 uh, benefits, but as you've heard, you don't qualify for Section 8 unless you're making below 50% of AMI. So a good number of our people are right in that, that window and are not going to be uh, able to, to qualify for that. Uh, I ask that the city find the additional funds to enable these still working tenants to also age in place. These are good people who by necessity must keep working and continue to shoulder the responsibility for their families. Yet as the plan stands now, their reward for being good citizens will be to lose their homes when they are most vulnerable. Now, one of the things that we talked about is, is uh, you know, the income qualification and, 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 you know, HPD's giving a number of reasons why they, they had no more flexibility. As Keith pointed out, this deal is unique. There is no other deal like this. Uh, they say that they have no flexibility in terms of, of income definition, but in fact, due to HUD requirements, but there's no HUD money in this deal. And so, I, to me, that does, that's not a, a, an answer that makes sense to me because there is no HUD money in this deal. Uh, they also uh, said that, that, that they could not like, extend the retirement benefit for two to eight years because of the lack of certainty of people's retirement income. But what I'd like to point out is while, you know, what people are going to be making when they're retiring, uh, is, is questionable when you're in your 30s and 40s. By the time you are in your 60s, it's pretty clear what your retirement income is going to be. You've got your Social Security number, and Social Security sends that to you every year of what you're going to make. You have your pension, uh, if you have a pension, and if you have a 401k. When I surveyed people and asked them, what degree of certainty do you have on your income um, you know, retirement income, you know, overwhelmingly people said it was a high degree of certainty. So, you know, HPD saying, well, we, you know, it's too uncertain, well, that just really doesn't hold water. It's, it, people have certainty about it. We can follow the same certification process, a one-time certification. People say, okay, I'm going to retire in four years. This is what I, I, my retirement income will be. They sign an affidavit, they swear to it then, and then when they retire, they sign another affidavit and say, yes, this in fact happened, or they say, well, it was a little more, it was a little less. And if uh, Waterside wants them and HPD wants them to recertify in a more detailed way, that can happen. So I think that that's, that's an important uh, aspect of this. Um, the other point I just want to make <clears throat> is it was uh, quite a surprise to me just now to hear from HPD about a couple or two people being in a two-bedroom apartment. We asked that question of HPD not once, but three separate times, and we're told three separate times that two people in a two-bedroom, typically a couple, uh, that were considered to be right-sized. And, and, and it was pointed out to us, if you go to the HPD guidelines, it says one to, uh, uh, in a two-bedroom, sorry, two to three people. So our point of view would be, A, there's no HUD money coming into this, so they're not bound by HUD guidelines and B, they represented to us three different times that, that two people in a two bedroom was okay. So we expect that to be the case and not to be in question. Um, so, um, so I'm, that, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit breaking take, here because I was taking notes, but- in, Take your time. Okay. Take your time. I have, breath. basically, th that, that's what I wanted to say about those tenants that are still working. And that is our key priority to enable every settling tenant at Waterside to be able to age in place if they want to do that. There are two additional points that have been brought up, uh, brought to my attention by, by the tenants. Again, this is about the income certification formula. We were told by HPD that they're following the HUD guideline 4350. And so I went and read that in some detail. And 
But again, our point is that it's, since it's not funded by federal money, we'd be much better off, and it's a, it's a clearer uh, representation of the, the, the income situation of seniors to look at how SCREE calculates income. Um, SCREE does not include retirement account distributions. And in retirement accounts, you've got to think of it. I mean, that's like a savings account. You've been saving that money all along, right? Now you are older and you are taking some of that out. But in fact, you know, some of those accounts require you to start taking it legally to take it out when you are age 70. And uh, what's been suggested by one of our tenants that including these required uh, distributions is really a form of ageism and, and, and is not fair because someone who is 68 is not and has, a, you know, something that has a requirement at age 70, they don't have to calculate that in their income certification. Whereas this couple, who's 74 and 82, they have to include it. So they're pointing out it's not fair and it's a form of ageism. Uh, so I'd be interested to hear how, how the conversation goes you know, with regard to that. The other thing that, that we think should be included in the income calculation is a deduction for medical expenses. And the reason is, and it's out-of-pocket medical expenses, the reason is because seniors have three times the amount of out-of-pocket medical expenses uh, as those uh, who are in their 30s and 40s. Again, the HPD guidelines, <coughs> you know, say you can't do this, but the HUD guidelines, in fact, allow for adjusted gross income for anybody that's 62 or older. So you can, in fact, under the HUD guideline, uh, deduct these deductions or in, uh, these medical out-of-pocket expenses. So in closing, I ask that the city modify this deal so that all of our settling tenants can age in place in our waterside homes in the community that we help to build. Thank you. <laughs> they all let the record reflect the only one clapping was for staff of an elected official's <laughs> office. I want to thank the tenants for a great yeah. and uh, thank you for your remark. Uh, could I just ask, ask one other thing? Could I ask all of the settling tenants that are here to please stand up? Sure. Just so that you can see. I mean, people can really do. Can we get the settling tenants on care camera? About this. And now I'd like we those. Cannot, we cannot turn, but hold on. Councilmember Powers, what, do you want to grab a photo of them? or? Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> so you can check at Keith Powers on Twitter because we cannot point the cameras so at you. Almost all of you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. You all look great. Thank you for being okay. here. Okay, and now I want to, the people to stand up who are still working and will not be able to retire by 2019, the end of 2019. Okay. And you can see it's about 30 percent. So, okay. All right. Thank you very much. We typically wait for the whole panel, but this is uh, we'll start I, with I, some I questions. I just had for you. one one uh, kind of question. That yeah. Obviously, the response is about uncertainty in the deal, mm -hmm. uh, how much money to put it in. If you that was a, the previous panel had made mention of how much money would have to be into the deal in order to accommodate the request for retirement. Do you think there's a way before certification or before the, before the deal is finalized to get a handle on how many people we're talking about in order to help make the financial situation sure. more certain? I think that and we so, do that. so, what would that yeah. be? Okay, let me ask you specifically, though, what you want me to find out. Well, I guess my question is, if, if there was uncertainty by the city to know how much money would have to be part of the deal in order to finalize uh -huh. it and put that money aside for the for this housing deal, the, the, the sort of there's an uncertainty. We've heard there's an uncertainty about how many people would be oh, how many other, right? how much money would need to be in the deal based on how many people would be taking advantage of it. So my question is whether, and I, and I meant to ask this on the previous panel, but if there is a means by which we could try before the deal is finalized to ascertain how many people are still working and plan to retire in one, two, three years, if you could say to those people who are somewhere here, if you don't retire in that time period, as you've stated, then, then you don't get be able to take advantage of the deal. If you do, then yeah. you do. Yeah, we can do that. Thank and how would you do that? Well, what I was going to say is, is, you know, what we have done, we have, in the course of this, we have, have conducted over four, 15 surveys, and, and we've had a very high response rate, about, you know, 42 percent, which is enough to be predictive for our number. Um, but ideally, it's obviously, it's best if you have everybody sign an answer. And, and I think that, 
if a requirement was made, you know, to, you know, either by you or by HPD, you know, that you have to, you know, this is part of the process, fill out this information, and, and particularly for those that are still working, uh, you know, you've got to sign here so that we can figure out what it would cost to do that. I, I think that we could do that. Okay, thank you. And I want to let the others go okay. as well, and I may have other questions. So quick, quick piece. So we're with the folks who didn't make it, we're actually now down to only six more people beyond this panel. Okay. There's just a question for you of you want if the if the remaining speakers all want three minutes or four minutes or just we'll play it as we go. Make it three minutes. Because okay. I think three, three is yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we, we have consensus for three minutes. There will be a timer and uh, when it goes off, it's up to you. Uh, you may go in whatever order you wish. Uh, Please state your name for the record. Also, our committee council wanted me to remind, to correct myself. I had said 24 hours. It is actually 72 hours. So you and everyone in the Tenants Association have 72 hours. If you are giving oral testimony and don't have it in writing, to provide it in writing. And they can email that testimony to? C-K-E-L-L-Y at E Y at council.nyc.gov. You may begin. Uh, before I start, just one question on that. Uh, I don't have a statement that I can submit to you, so can I just submit that later with the other written stuff? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Cunningham. Uh, I want to thank Chairman Callis and this committee for giving me this opportunity to speak uh, in favor of the waterside proposal. Uh, I'd also like to speak to implore you and whoever is in the driver's seat to add or to adopt an extended time frame for people that are still working, that need to still work to recertify. I think the best way for me to do this is to kind of put a human face on it. Uh, if some of the people are here that were at one of the prior hearings have heard this, then it's a repeat. For those of you that weren't, then it'll be something new. But my story quickly is that I've lived at Waterside for 42 years. Uh, I came there in the 70s. I met my wife there. We had children. We raised our children there. They went to their first nursery school there. And we love Waterside. And we love the management of Waterside and we love everything about it. Unfortunately, at 73, I'm now faced with a situation I never thought I would be faced with in my life. And that would be that I didn't know if I'd be able to afford to put a roof over my head in the home that I'd lived in for 40 plus years. My wife and I invested in our children, in their education, college, four years, graduate school, and help along the way. So we didn't invest in stocks and bonds or big retirement accounts. I think. I used to think I was middle class. I don't think I rate that anymore. It's imperative that my wife and I continue to work, even though we're both clearly of retirement age, because we have financial obligations that we have to meet. And it's a catch-22, because if we continue to work to meet those, which we must, and if this proposal goes through with a 2019 drop dead date for certification, there's no way that we can stay at Waterside and it defeats the purpose of affordable housing. We all agree that affordable housing is a good thing. Everybody in this room will agree to that. It's just a question of how we get there. So I would urge you and whoever makes the decisions to allow us to work allow us to continue to be viable, allow us to continue to contribute to the tax base, allow us to continue to contribute to the community. And then when we can retire 
and if we're healthy enough to continue to work for another six or seven years, let us recertify then. We're not asking for anything special, no special treatment. Just give us the same opportunity that somebody that chronologically is of retirement age and economically is able to do it at this time. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you for taking a day off work. Who would like to go next? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, first of all, um, quite a lot of you are familiar with me coming to these along with Janet. I have to say, without Janet, we wouldn't be here, and we are all so appreciative of all the work she has done. <laughs> and secondly, I should mention that I've been tenant of Waterside 44 years from the very beginning. I've helped my community in the sense that I got a nursery school started with Mr. Ravage, kindly offering to let us have it for free when we got it going. Both my kids grew up there. I've moved down from a three-bedroom to two-bedroom to one-bedroom apartment over the years. Basically, the um, settling of Waterside, I was one of the four members representing the people in 40 building, which along with being City Mitchell Armour was also federally subsidized, which is something that hasn't come up here tonight. I'm terribly sorry to interrupt our uh, legal and future stenographer have requested that you share your name. Oh, I'm record. terribly sorry. It's My okay. name's Norma Davis, and uh, Please continue. proud tenant of 40 Waterside Plaza for 44 years. I okay. had rudely interrupted you as you were discussing the HUD. Okay. So um, I just wanted to point out so many things have come up about um, extending the retirement age. I am one of those very fortunate in one way, but I will be 77 this year. I fully retired at 66 after working as a medical lab technologist, often two jobs to keep my family going. I'm very happy to say they're all doing fine. I unfortunately have to work because my social security equals my rent. And in fact, right now, my rent is more than my social security. I'm also cursed with the RMDs that you've been talking about. I'm over 70 and a half, so therefore I have to pay a minimum distribution, which is now going to be considered income. On top of all this is the insult that I now, because of the RMDs and my part-time work, I'm paying nearly 80% tax on my social security. So I'm being hit every which way my net income is not that huge, but I have doubled my social security by working part time. And I'm very lucky that I can still do that and that my brains are still functioning and my legs are still walking and I really enjoy it. So um, somehow or another, I would really like to push the RMD thing that, um, yes, I feel penalized. This is on money that I saved hard to put in an IRA. I do understand that it's basically they're looking at interest or something that has been deferred as you've saved over the years, but it really, really is hard. And at the same time, I'm so appreciative of the fact that I can stay at Waterside. I really, really hope to be able to do the rent freeze and the rent reset. I don't think next this year I'm going to say I'm going to retire again or number one question. Am I considered a retired person now? And I would have really appreciate knowing the answer to that. And thank you so much for everything you've done. And also thank you to Waterside and Mr. Davis and Mr. Ravage for letting me stay in this marvelous place all these years. Thank you. Next. Hi, my name is Chris Spangler. Press the silver button so that the red light is on. Thank you. Perfect. Greetings, Council Member Ben Kalis, Keith, Peter, Janet, and tenants. In advance, thanks for taking the time to hear me. I ask that you please, as a leader and decision maker, help us with this life-changing situation. Chairman Kalos, I am passionately, urgently, and in desperation asking that you please help us get a second rent reset in the future. 
Under the current proposed deal, my rent will be frozen. However, under a second rent reset is secured now for the future, I will not be able to live the rest of my life out at Waterside. There are one third of the settling tenants that are also in my situation. Please make this an equitable deal for all of us settling tenants. Waterside has been my home for over 25 years. When I collect Social Security at any time, I will not be able to afford my current frozen rent. I am asking that at the time of my retirement, my income and rent to get reviewed again. In other words, a second certification please take place. Please help us keep our homes and our community. Please implement something now as opposed to later so that we know now for certain that we'll be able to have our homes and live in them in the future. These are our lives. I thank you from my heart. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to turn to Council Member Powers for some questions. Thank you. I want to just A, clarify that retirement is not actually the um, the definition here is just substantive change of income or change of income, I guess, really, that would allow you to take a different, um, a different category. So even if you took a new job and it was less money, that could be reflected in it. And I will, I will uh, correct the record if I am wrong about that, but just want to clarify. Um, can we just, I just a couple of questions, and maybe Jan, this is more for you, but, but anybody else obviously has information. Can you tell us um, how many years you're asking in terms of um, what would be allowable in terms of keeping the window open for retirement? And second, is the amount of people that would be covered by that or, or how many people are yeah, kind of so, in this category? So again, based on our surveys, uh, if we went up to eight years, that would bring in 96% of all of the settling tenants. There are about you know, six or eight households that are people in their early 50s. Uh, and, and some are even younger than that, and those are situations where it's a successor tenant, so it might be somebody in their early 30s. So I think that, you know, we're really focused on people that are sort of in, in, in the last trimester of their life or the, you know, maybe even, who knows, <laughs> I hope it's at least a trimester, who knows, I, I'm shooting, I want to be in my 90s sometime. Uh, but we want to cover those people, people that are sort of still in, in the prime of their career, we feel uh, you know, less uh, less passionately about that particular situation, and also it's a very small number. And, and do you know what the number is we're talking about? How many tenants are not would be are asking for a, a second reset because of they're still working and believe that they'll have a so changing. so when we looked at those numbers, uh, the people that are still working, about half of them are what we would call are situations like Norma. They are entitled to a rent reduction right now with their still working income, and then if they retire, they would get an, an additional uh, reduction. So so about half of the people that are working now are, are entitled to a reduction right now, and I mean still working, not gonna retire by the end of 2019, and then they, but when you go over to, uh, you know, uh, 2019, I mean, sorry, that the, everybody that's still working, it, it would literally be all but seven households out of 97 that would get the freeze and a rent, rent reduction. Some of them just a small rent reduction, you know, but, but some significant. Because what happens is somebody is, you know, working full time, you know, they're, they're doing very well and, and they retire, they might only be getting social security. You know, like, like Richard, they might not have an IRA or, you know, a, a KEO plan or whatever. And there are a lot of people in that situation. Particularly if you're an entrepreneur, you're in that situation too. And just one more question, so we can uh, keep uh, letting folks testify. There's there's some folks who want to take a, a second reset because they're going to have I think this is your yeah, scenario right. who are going to take advantage of the reset and then have another change in income and right. take it. Mm -hmm. And there's people who wanted to get the first reset because they'll they're expecting to retire and they're above what the threshold is for day. Do you know how many are in that are in each category? I have it, but I can't tell you off the top of my head. You know how many people are over one. Can you follow are you saying us? What, over one sixty five AMI now? Is that what you're saying? I guess it could be non rent burden under one sixty five that then would become rent burdened in a future time, or people over one sixty five who will be able to get a rent freeze, but then drop down. If that makes sense. I, I'll get back to you okay. on that. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you, and I just want to say thank you to all of you. I've know many of you by name and by face, but I didn't I didn't uh, a year ago because you show up and you show up often and you show up uh, to make your voices heard. And uh, Janet, I will just say if you don't know this, shows up everywhere she needs to be to make sure you are getting the best deal. She really deserves uh, your jazz hands. That's correct. <laughs> thank you, and thank you to Cheer Kills. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and just. Thank you, again, thank you for coming to, if I haven't said it in this forum, just thank you for coming to my State of the District the other day. Uh, and I just want to thank Councilmember Powers. I, I, I will just say I think he has been negotiating very strongly for the tenants. In terms of uh, just in response to some of the testimony, the City Council has a principle called member deference where we focus on the local member because in this case he's been working on it since he's been elected, which is like one year, 14 day, 13 days and uh, 15 hours and 37 minutes and like this is all he's been talking about for all of that time. It's been his singular focus versus with others we will be uh, coming in at it just at a hearing point. So he really has the expertise and additionally, the other big reason for member deference is because all of you have the power of elections and voting. So uh, that is one key. So as you, as you look at it, the, the, the reason this is happening and the decision maker in this is in a large part uh, council member powers and we're, we're here just to support him, the great work that he's doing and the great work that your tenants association is doing and that you've been able uh, to do. So thank you, I will excuse this panel our next panel Thank you, Keith. Thank you. <laughs> is Mark Harris. Do we have Mark Harris here? Come on up, Mark. Todd Shapiro. Perfect. Is that an A or an O? Okay. Robert Blumenblatt. Great. Elizabeth White. Do we have Elizabeth White? Okay, thank you. Uh, so Elizabeth White was represented well by Janet, and then we have Wendy Arnon, Arnon. Not seeing Wendy Arnon again. It is uh, it is 72 hours. If you have anything you would like to uh, add. Uh, whoever wants to go first is welcome to uh, go, please. Uh, we're we're going to stick with that three minutes. My name is Todd Shapiro. Please press the silver button and speak into the mic. Make sure it's pointed at you. Hi there. My name is Todd Shapiro. I'm a longtime resident of Waterside uh, with my wife and my two sons. And I have this brief statement that I'll read, and I'd like to thank Councilman Powers and Janet and all the other people, it's the effort they put in is just amazing. And uh, I'll read my statement. I would like to thank the Mayor and City Council for their affordable living and aging in place policies which will be so helpful to all our Waterside neighbors. But to please consider our story and those of others as the policy is debated and finalized. My wife Julie and I have lived at Waterside since 1988 and raised a family there. My parents and brothers and sisters-in-law, as well as many nieces and nephews, all lived and some continue to live at Waterside Plaza, so our family has deep roots here and in the local community. My business, the New York City Seminar and Conference Center, which is a value meeting venue for nonprofits, startup companies, local businesses, and others, uh, dates back to 1989 uh, and is located in Flatiron, Chelsea, and is a well-established classic local small business. I serve on Community Board 5, and my kids both attend at a local public school, the School of the Future. My wife is active in the WTA. I am root and branch part of this community and neighborhood in every sense. And I often describe Waterside Plaza in former days before the rents escalated out of Mitchell Lama as a big, happy New York City kibbutz. My wife, Julie, who works at a local nonprofit, and I can charitably be described as a modest middle-class family. As a small business, my income is prone to fluctuation as we are in the hospitality industry. So with my family's current rent of almost 60,000 per year, or 5,000 per month, including electricity and garage, right now both of us have to continue to work and we can't even think about retiring. 
Without the prospect of a rent reset, we would almost certainly have to move out, which would be heartbreaking to us and our extended family. My wife and I hope to continue to work until we turn 65. My wife is 58 and I'm 59, and continue our business and community involvement. Aside from our love for New York City and the community at Waterside, we have no choice but to continue working to pay our rent and also to help support both of our sons who are disabled if we are fortunate enough to get a rent reset. Of course, when we retire and are living on Social Security and IRA distributions, any hope of our staying at Waterside and in the community is very likely dependent upon our being able to apply for an additional reset in the years beyond 2019. Our situation is similar to many of our hardworking middle class friends and neighbors at Waterside. It would be incredibly frustrating and unfortunate for all of us who have worked hard all these years to stay in Waterside as many of our neighbors have been compelled to leave by rising rents only to have a possible reprieve and be just out of reach unless the reset can be offered to us when we are ready to retire. Just one more thing. We've heard all of the people from the various departments. The pe people like myself who are businessmen and families, even when we retire, we're part of this community. So whatever money the city has to come up with, that is an investment in our community and in Waterside, and, and they have to make it happen. Thank you. Oh. My, name is My name is Robert Blumenblatt. Uh, I'm neutral on this issue because I'm not informed sufficiently, so I'm not for it or against it. Uh, my parents and I came to the United States in 1956. We lived in the Bronx. In 1975, my father was mugged in the getting mail out of the mailbox. So he was looking for new housing with my mother. I found housing at Waterside Plaza and we moved in in 1975. My parents having been Holocaust survivors, when my father retired and became ill, I decided to be his take, caretaker. This was in 1998, more or less. Then I was shocked in 2001 when the housing went off Mitchell Lama. Now, I get a rent bill. I don't even know if I'm a settling tenant or not. I'm right now in court. I'm being sued for the rent. I don't know what my rent is because I don't know even if I'm a settling tenant. I don't have any paper to show whether I'm a settling tenant. So hopefully I could re resolve my conflict with Mr. Peter, who is sitting here. But I, I don't know. Um, I wish Mr. Peter the best. I hope the tenant, my fellow tenants get what they deserve. They having moved into the place under the Mitchell Lama program, and now I hear these horrible stories, which luckily for me, my parents didn't have to go through because they didn't live long enough. You understand? So I really rely on the council to make the judgment on my behalf because I am not an accountant. I don't like to do this kind of work. And perhaps I'll even be able to work as an entrepreneur, raise my rent, get a job for my retirement, having retired in 1998 or so, when my father got ill. And my mother just died a, a, couple, a few years ago. So I have to now decide whether I can write my writings, which is what I wanted to do. I was a teacher and a professor of particle physics and laboratory physics. I took care of my parents, and now I have to figure out if I'll live to 99, by which time I will die, and maybe I don't have to worry about being evicted. <laughs> it was a time in which interest rates were 5%, but that's over. So. Perhaps Peter and I could enter into some entrepreneurial venture, and then I will be able to cover my rent. But I also have sympathy for my fellow tenants, and I know who, which, which councilman I like, Honorable Chaim Deutsch, because he asked an interesting question. Am I entitled to 
co-op options on my space. I just discovered that possibility today. There are some Michelamas that are structured as a co-op. Uh, it appears that yours are structured as a rental. I apologize to you. Being 74 years old, one of my issues is that I didn't get my hearing aid yet. So we will... We will work with your, you and your local member to make sure we get you uh, a hearing aid. Uh, I would also love to talk to you a little bit about the Higgs boson, if you have some chance afterwards. And what uh, Chaim was re referring to is that some Michelamas were initially structured uh, as co-ops and others were structured as rentals. From your records, I believe you're a rental. Uh, we'll also work with uh, your council member, and it appears that Mr. Peter is open to trying to figure out what's going on with your uh, back rent. He, let, let the record reflect he's given a thumbs up. So uh, thank you. Your time here was not wasted. And we have our final speaker on this issue. Hi, um, my name is Mark Harris. I'm a uh, retired uh, New York City uh, teacher. I want to thank uh, Keith Powers and everybody else involved in Janet Handel uh, for uh, shepherding this uh, program. Uh, fortunately, I am retired, so I can take advantage of the opportunity. Uh, if we didn't have this opportunity, I probably couldn't continue living at uh, Waterside. I've been there since the early 80s. But I do ask that you do extend it to cover all the other residents who are and presently retired uh, that would be able to take advantage of this uh, if they had been up the road. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who wishes to testify? Seeing none, I will now close the uh, public hearing on land use items 310 and 311. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to move on to our next land use item. Uh, the next land use item is land use item 313, 4697 Third Avenue, an application that will facilitate the development of a new mixed use eight story building providing 52 units of affordable housing in Councilmember Torres' district in the Bronx. This project will be developed under HPD's ELLA program, 15% of the units will be reserved for formerly homeless households. Specifically, HPD seeks approval for an urban development action area designation for project approval and disposition approval for block 3041, lot 38 and 40. The disposition area contains two vacant lots that are previously used as parking lots for city vehicles. I now open the public hearing on land use item 313. 4697 Third Avenue would like to invite HPD to present its testimony. Please state your names uh, for the record. Really quickly before that, can we have someone from council uh, do the computer so they can pull their presentation up? If you can begin reading, so let's do the names, you'll read the testimony, and in the meantime, we'll figure out the computer. Um, before you state it, I know Mr. Weinstein has been sworn in, so I'll just remind you that you're under oath. And for the rest of you, can you um, state your name before answering the question? Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Lacey Tauber, HPD, yes. Samantha Magistro, Bronx Pro, yes. Jay Fox, Bronx Pro, yes. You may begin reading the prepared testimony. Do we have a copy of the testimony? It is coming to us now. Please begin. Okay. Um, <clears throat> land use item number 313 consists of a ULERP action seeking UDAP area designation, project, and disposition approval for two vacant city-owned lots at 4697 Third Avenue in the Belmont section of the Bronx, Council District 15. The sponsor, Bronx Pro LLC, was selected through competitive process, and their goal is to construct an eight-story mixed-use residential building with ground floor commercial space under HPD's extremely low and low-income affordability program, ELLA. Under the ELLA program, sponsors develop multifamily buildings in order to create low-income rental housing for families with a range of incomes from 30 to 60 percent of the area median income, and projects may include a tier of units with rents targeted to households earning up to 100 percent AMI. Subject to project underwriting, up to 30% of the units may be rented to formerly homeless households referred by the Department of Homeless Housing or other public agencies. 
The project area will incorporate HPD's inclusionary housing program, which encourages development of affordable housing by allowing additional floor area bonus for projects that allocate 25% of the residential floor area as permanently affordable. The project site consists of a vacant underutilized lot that was recently used to park city vehicles. The new building will consist of 52 rental units plus one superintendent's unit with a mixture of unit types including seven studios, 19 one bedrooms, 22 bedrooms, and seven three bedrooms. Units will be affordable at rents between 30 and 80% of AMI, which is approximately $354 at the lowest income tier for a studio to $1,993 at the highest in income tier for a three bedroom apartment. The team has applied to um, the state HCR for eight project-based vouchers. These would be used for eight formerly homeless households, approximately 15% of the units. Formerly homeless tenants referred by DHS and other city agencies will pay up to 30% of their income as rent. Of the 52 units, 13 will be permanently affordable under the inclusionary housing program. Amenities include a terrace roof garden with a playground, an exercise room, laundry room, and bike parking. The proposed building will be designed to passive house standards and include a rainwater harvesting system and photovoltaic panels on the roof. Additionally, the ground floor will contain approximately 10,700 square feet of commercial space. Um, as of January 8th, the estimated total development cost is $32,647,542, which is subject to change. Additionally, assuming that the pending application for state funding through HCR is, is successful, city subsidy is estimated at 19% of TDC, approximately $6,360,000. As an ELLA, this will receive an as-of-right tax exemption under the 420C, and the regulatory agreement will have a term of 60 years. In order to facilitate the development of the 4697 Third Avenue project, HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking approval of land use item 313. And Bronx Pro has a presentation that they'd please, like to talk through. Please do it in three minutes. Short and sweet. Short and sweet. Great. Uh, real quickly, um, Bronx, I'll just introduce ourselves. My name is Samantha Magistro. I'm a principal at Bronx Pro. Uh, Bronx Pro is an affordable housing developer for the last 20 years. We started as a property manager in the Bronx, and we've had a presence in this community since the 70s. Um, Bronx Pro has three main missions. One is to build beautiful housing. Two, that is sustainable for the long term. And three, that we add, you know, deep community impact into all the projects that we do. And this particular project at 4697 Third Avenue reflects uh, those priorities. Uh, this is a picture of, oh, this is our, our mission. I'm sorry, I had not Real quickly, the site is um, in Community Board 6. It's located just south of Fordham Road, which is a very large commercial area um, with institutions as well. Um, so our project kind of brids, br bridges some residential and commercial uses. Here are some site photos. Um, currently unused site that was formerly, that's currently owned by the Department of Transportation. Again, it's eight-story building with 53 units, one for a super. Um, the financing is still pending, but we have an application in with the New York State HCR for 9% tax credits. And as was mentioned, in the, it's, the TDC is estimated at $32,600,000. So just real quickly, um, Thanks to the HPD Ella term sheet, we have a real diversity of incomes that haven't been um, served in the past. Um, so we have 15% homeless, 8% at 30% of AMI, 12% at 40, 12% at 50% of AMI, um, and 23% at 70% of AMI, and 30% at 80. I don't need to go through um, all of the slides here, but um, I think it's important to note that we have outdoor activities um, for the residents and their families that will be there. We have a gym on site. Um, I also, uh, we're excited to be um, the first floor to be full retail. Um, we don't have an identified tenant yet, but we hope to bring someone that will bring new opportunities and amenities to the community. Um, finally, I think it's important to note that we're building very sustainable from a green perspective. That's very important to Bronx Pro and as a long-term owner and operator. Um, so the building is currently designed to meet Passive House. And if you have time, the last slide just goes through some of those um, sustainable features. 
And thank you. I forgot to say thank you in the beginning for having us. Okay. <laughs> Who's the contractor? Um, Bronx Pro Affiliate Home Builders. So we are the contractor here as well. How long has this uh, been a vacant land used for uh, a piece of vacant land used for parking? We're actually not sure exactly when NYPD uh, vacated the site, um, but Bronx Pro was awarded the site through our um, NIHOP NCP RFP about two years ago. Does that sound right? Yeah, and I think we submitted the RFP in 2015. And I should just say that, like that, that is a different program. And then, just as the development um, process was taking place, um, we realized that the site um, could accommodate enough density for an ELLA, um, which allows us to get to um, lower income affordability. And so, you know, we felt that this that that was a better use for the site, and that's why uh, we switched the programs. Uh, what are the hard costs on the project? Oh, sorry. Uh, Twenty-one million five hundred thousand. What are the soft costs? Seven million one hundred thousand. I am missing four million dollars. Um, so I didn't include the contingency. So if you want to have the whole hard cost structure, it's twenty two six hundred thousand twenty two million six hundred thousand, including the hard cost contingency. We have a developer fee of two point nine million. Is there a reason you chose to do one elevator versus two for the uh, building? Yeah, we looked at this issue actually in terms of thinking about it. We have other buildings in our portfolio that operate with one elevator successfully and we haven't had an issue. Um, also on a small site like this, uh, the economies of scale are difficult and so we are trying to make the project as feasible as, as possible. Our architects also reached out to the elevator comp um, contractor that we're working with and did an analysis to make sure that the one elevator would meet the needs of the residents living there. What's the median household income of the surrounding community board, census tract, or neighborhood? It's about 30% of AMI. For the uh, commercial, give me one second, sorry. Wilfredo? The commercial unit, what restrictions will be on that? Will that be at market rate, or will it be for a large mom and pop or supermarket, or what is your uh, target for the large square footage of commercial? I think that's a great question. Uh, right now we have structured um, a rent that we think is feasible to uh, local um, businesses are ideal. Um, we certainly do our open to ideas. Um, we have also considered making it three small spaces if that was the needs from the community. But it's structured for um, local local businesses. If That's what we've had the most success with in our portfolio is working with local run businesses that are sustainable in our smaller retail spaces. What is the land value? Um, the appraised value is um, about four million two hundred and fifteen thousand. Uh, were there any additional land use actions to increase the value, the underlying value? No. In terms of the uh, tax abatement, you are not seeking city council approval, which was typical in an Article Eleven, but not in a four twenty C, where it is as of right. Uh, what is the uh, value of the four twenty C tax? Because it's as of right, we don't calculate the value in these in these projects. You indicate that the HPD share of this project cost 
is 19% or 6.3 million. What is the DHCR share expected to be? Um, so DHCR is um, providing the 9% tax credits, so that um, will generate, and as well as state tax credits, we applied. I just want to just preface that we have applied and we haven't been awarded. So um, those two together, if you're looking at the uh, tax credit equity that's generated, um, that is about 51%. We've also applied for SIF, uh, which is $2 million, which is six. So, uh, let, let's do one program at a time. So New York State DHCR, what's the program? Um, low income housing tax credits is the state. And then there's also the state tax credits. So you're looking for the 9% LHTCs and, sorry, the LHTCs will will cover 9% of the costs? Sorry. So the 9% library, um, low income housing tax credit covers 44% of the costs. We're also applying for state tax credits, which will cover close to 8% of the costs. Sorry, hold on. I missed that. I'm a little nervous, I'm sorry. Don't be nervous. <laughs> We're trying to do six things at once, so I'm sorry to make you repeat yourself. So you're getting 19% from the city, 44% from the low income housing tax credit sale. And what is the, what were the additional sources? State tax credits. Okay. And what is the state tax credit that you're expecting? Um, it's a, I'm just blanking on how to describe it. It's another level of tax credits that we can apply to that um, investors can take a credit on their state um, tax And bargain. how much do you anticipate that to cover of the project cost? 7.8%. Um, okay, I appreciate your transparency. Is there any city capital being invested? Uh, this, uh, no, no reso -A. But there is another source, or city capital you're asking about? Ella. Ella. Oh, well, the Ella, yes. So the Ella is um, 6.3 at 19%. And are you going, are you, what are you expecting the HP, it's HPD Ella or HDC Ella or it's both? It's HPD Ella. Okay. And what is this per unit subsidy that you expect? 120000 per DU. Okay. So you're not going to get the full, if they gave you the additional $25,000 per DU, would that get us a second elevator? Potentially. Oh, was that the decision? Yeah, that, that, Sorry. So, yeah, yeah thank you. You, lose, you lost a lot of units. Yeah, we'd also look at, we might lose units as well. Got it. Okay. So you're getting less than you need. Uh, sorry, than, than others. So um, because you're getting other sources of funding, or is there any anything else that uh, I haven't asked you that you're getting money from? Yeah, there's one more source um, okay. that is supporting the retail space um, that we apply to with the state called SIF, Community Investment Fund Dollars, it's $2 million. Um, and that really allows for the transaction to work. Never heard of the SIF before. I learned something new every day. Uh, Very underutilized program. OK. Uh, I don't think you said that into a mic, but, the ref but uh, if you want to say it. Sorry, I was just saying the SIF is just happens to be okay. a very underutilized state program that supports um, commercial spaces. Is Bronx Pro uh, and the Bronx Pro construction affiliate that I believe is a wholly owned subsidiary, uh, are you registered MWBEs or do you have executive leadership that are minorities and women? Uh, so Bronx Pro Group is owned by 100% by women, okay. but we're not certified. Um, Home Builders is still owned by um, Peter Magistro, who is my father and the uh, founder of Bronx Pro. Um, but if you're talking about uh, decision makers, about 55% of our decision makers are women or minorities. And in terms of the construction company, sorry, in terms of the uh, architects and other folks on the deal? Sure, our architect is a certified women-owned business, and our title company is also a certified women-owned bus business. In terms of the folks that uh, are part of your construction company, uh, will they be getting, 
will they be getting paid enough that they won't need the affordable housing that they are building or will they be part of making the affordable housing crisis worse? So my under so we're a general contractor and we um, subcontract all of our of our trades. Um, when I ask this question, um, my understanding is that all of the jobs will be competitive in terms of um, the wage and um, you know appropriate to the work that the person will be doing. Uh, the range that was provided to me was for eight as low as eighteen dollars um, per hour up to a hundred dollars per hour, um, and that's the range. That's the information that I know. At $100 an hour, that means folks would be making $182,000, which would mean they would not qualify for affordable housing. That would make me very happy. At a range of $18 an hour, that is $32,760 a year, assuming they work 35 hours a week, 52 weeks a year. Uh, that would put them squarely within the 30% AMI, assuming a, a uh, actually it would put them between 40 and 50 and if they were single and uh, generally within the 30 to 40 if they had another person in the house. Uh, so I, I guess I would just be concerned that um, given the size of this and the number of 30, per do, do you expect to have more workers on the site than units that you will be building? So it's 52 so units, so w will you have 52 more, more than 52 folks earning less than 80% of AMI, so that would be less than 60,000 or 80, less than 60,000 a year. I'm sorry, I don't have the information to answer that question. But, but you get where I'm I, coming from. Yeah, no, I, the point is taken. Uh, similarly, will all of the folks on the construction side have health insurance? And God forbid anything happens on the site, there's a lot of injuries, especially in construction, that they can have disability, so that they have more than just workers' comp. Um, I'd have to look into that question and get back to you. Did HPD by any chance let you know that I'd be asking these questions? Um, yes, but I didn't um, go into, I didn't get the one on the health insurance, so. Sure. Do the executives of uh, Bronx Pro get health insurance? So, um, you know, to speak directly, we um, offer folks to buy into health insurance, That's, so they have access to it, but it's different than making a contribution. Um, it's certainly something that we're looking at, but as a small business, we've been managing, balancing it. Once upon a time, I ran a company in California, and California it requires that any full, you, you have to offer benefits from the top to the bottom. So if managerial employees get a uh, certain benefit and contribution towards health insurance, then everyone in the company does, which is kind of cool. Yeah, and so that's um, true at Bronx Pro, but maybe just in the other direction, right? So everyone has access to purchase in. Um, so so no, I don't so have a different benefits package than anybody else on my team, I guess is what I'm trying to say. That, that's, it's better than nothing. So I, I appreciate that. In terms of those operating your facility, will you be operating the facility or will somebody else be operating the facility? Um, another affiliate of ours will be the property manager. Is it a wholly owned subsidiary? Um, no, it's owned by another family member of mine. Okay, so, so possibly closely held. Closely uh, held, and I think that's appropriate, yes. Uh, same question regarding those employees. So here we have the same question. Um, so let's start with the, um, super. yeah, so the super um, will be, um, is scheduled to make 55,000 a year. Mm -hmm. uh, the porter will be a part-time position. We're gonna be sharing it with other um, locations, um, but that salary structure is at 43,000. And they'll have health insurance, disability benefits, and a retirement vehicle? Um, so in terms of health insurance, the answer is the same. They have the access to buy into our health insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we have been thinking about this closely in this year. Um, I know that your preference isn't 401ks, but we are doing a 3% contribution to 401k across our enterprises. And all employees will have access to that? Correct. Fair enough. Uh, Point of trivia, I'm an ERISA attorney by trade, and uh, I am, have authored legislation with our, our former public advocate, now Attorney General, and our, the mayor has recently endorsed to make retirement accessible Roth IRAs to every city employee who does city, not employee, but everyone who works in the city to have access. Uh, 
think those are all the standard questions. Uh, we're now on my favorite question. Uh, do you have a local hire requirement? Um, we will be in compliance with Hire MYC and we will meet our local hiring through that. If somebody lives in the Bronx and in particular Belmont and they're watching right now and all they want to do is walk over to 4697 3rd Avenue in the morning, build that building and help operate it after it goes up, what number should they call in order to get a job from you? So we have put a link on our website. Is that sufficient? I'm going to end up pulling your website up. What is it? They told me it was up. www.bronxprogroup.com. And where do I find the link? Because I will read the number once I get it. <laughs> you know what? Do you think the number is the best bet? They told me that the link would be up for, for our hearing today. But yes, yeah, so this the number would be 718 294 5840. The project is up on the website, and for folks who are just trying to find it, uh, it would be under careers. Yes. So click the careers link on the Bronx Pro website, and our internet is incredibly fast for government. <laughs> and it appears that you're currently hiring for a compliance specialist and a director of development. Um, As we have dated. <laughs> how, however, I, I guess what I'm looking for more is just the, the trade jobs, the service jobs, and the jobs that don't require any, um, I, I believe for local hire and for the Hire NYC program, it's not about having, and I imagine these are good jobs and high paying jobs, but we're looking for both those and just the job where somebody can just walk in, get the training from you, get everything they need so that they can just walk in out of whether or not they have a high school education or not, just walk in, get that job, and have enough money to support their family and not need affordable housing. Okay. And I appreciate the serious of that, so we'll make sure that we have everything updated appropriately. Uh, are there any members of the public here to testify on this item? I, I will note that uh, Council Member Torres was here. Uh, this concludes today's hearing on uh, these land use items. All the items heard today will be laid over. I'd like to thank council and land use staff for preparing today's hearing. Members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned.